show is just packed. I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Smith Radio. Your host, Brian Smith and... Carrie Smith. Giving you all the late-breaking details of last week, wrapping it all up, making sense of it all, telling you about what they're trying to hide and... And ditch on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, especially on a holiday weekend. No politics uh, involved whatsoever, Mr. <laughs> FBI Comey. Uh, right. <laughs> Letting you know what uh, what they were trying to uh, hide from you and skirt, skirt the issues. Not only that, but telling you the lies, all the liar liars that are out there <laughs> and what they're saying and what they're not saying. Oh, my goodness. Well, today is September 11th, 2016, exactly 15 years to the day that um, that was our generation. I mean, the Generation Xers, that, that was our uh, Pearl Harbor. Yeah, I was actually 25 years old at the time, and I was still in inactive reserves in the military. I actually called up my recruiter. I had already served my four years active duty and uh, a lot of people don't realize this. When you sign up for the service, or at least when I did, you sign up for eight years, period. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about that. When people say, oh, I was in four years, what they really mean is that for four out of those eight years, I was on active duty, and the other four, you're on inactive reserves. And it just so happens that I was still on inactive reserves on September 11th, and I had to call up my recruiter and say, I'm ready to roll. And he said, <laughs> make this happen. thanks for calling. We have your phone number and your uh, address, and we will certainly give you a call if we need you. And then uh, as things rolled and, and uh, you know, George Bush and everybody else made a debacle out of the war on terror, I had dropped out of the, um, the uh, inactive reserves. I'd served my full eight years, and that was the end of me. Right. So. It's a similar situation with me as well. Uh, there, you know, you're in four years. And you say I did my four, but technically they could call you back with oh yeah in those eight and years. And they did. There were a lot of reservists that actually did get called and were uh, serving in an active combat role when um, they had originally just signed up for the – they call it active reserves. Right. Active reserves is when you are like what they call a weekend warrior where right. you're actually serving <laughs> right. on um, – what is it? Uh, one weekend a month or something like that? Oh, we got a phone call. We got a there. call. Hold on one second. Who might this be? You're on Smith Radio with Brian Smith and Carrie Smith. Oh, can we hear him? Can you hear us? Uh oh. Are what? you there? We're anxiously waiting a call from Scott Isbell. Hopefully, this. Can you hear me now? Oh, oh yes. There he is. You must have had it on mute. <laughs> there we go. So we have on the line, Scott, is it, is it's, it, there's no A in there. So it, is it is Bell? Yep. That's okay. exactly right. Is Bell without an A in there. And he is yep. the very talented musician that you may have seen on uh, YouTube or whatnot. What, what other platforms can you be listened to? Uh, you can, I'm on SoundCloud. I'm on Spotify and iTunes, Google play, uh, YouTube, well, if you yeah, type, pretty much everywhere. Right. So, folks, if you type his name in the Google, it's Scott, S-C-O-T-T, I-S-B-E-L-L, and, and, and imagine is Bell, and then make it one word. And all, all his official website, his Twitter account, everything will come pop right up, and it'll be right there in your face. And we're glad to have you. So, um, we talk about Trump, and uh, it just so happens uh, you happen to be in the music field, and and I guess we, you'd be considered a conservative, right? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I, I've honestly, I mean, I often say I'm a liberal conservative where I'm fiscally conservative, but a little more liberal on the other end. But, and, and I mean, and liberals always say, oh, that's not a real thing. And I'm like, 
whatever. And uh, so, yeah, I can, but I guess I'm definitely, you know, consider myself a, a conservative. And, uh, you know, it's kind of an unusual thing in, in the entertainment industry, as you know. Now, you're with, um, is it Wu Tang Productions? Yeah, so I'm signed to the Wu Tang Clan. Um, I uh, am the first pop artist to ever work with the Wu Tang Clan okay. uh, and get signed to Wu Tang Management. So that's been pretty good. Let me ask you this, Scott, real quick. And, and I've got to be honest with you, man. Um, it, please don't be offended. I, what, like, what age, where are you around age wise? <laughs> I'm 22. Okay. So, so the millennial. At 22 years old. Uh, 15 years ago, you were seven. Do you have any recollection or any feelings about when 9-11 happened? Yeah, so I remember uh, in in school, I remember uh, they it would happen during school. And I remember they kind of, all the teachers apparently had a meeting during lunch and uh, they were like decided not to talk about it until the kids got home because, oh, interesting. Um, because also there was actually uh, the, one of the I forget, her last name was Sweeney. I think Amy Sweeney. She, uh, she was killed in one of the planes on nine 11 and she was from the town over next to me, Boxborough, Massachusetts. Wow. Um, and so I know, um, that was hard on her family, but she was the she was one of the the um, stewardesses on the plane that um, uh, actually like reported when they were calling in the seat numbers that the the terrorists were sitting in, so that she helped you know figure out some stuff before unfortunately the plane crashed. Now, how did they know this woman? Did they know her personally, or or did it just so happen they they were from the same town? Um, well, they were from just happened to be from the same town. Um, but I think the biggest thing was the schools didn't know how to, you know, they didn't, they weren't sure how much they wanted their, you know, kids of parents at the school. They didn't, you know, they're not sure how much parents would want, want to expose exactly what went on that day. Um, I don't know. I guess it's just whatever they worry about, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely remember I, I remember it occurring, but I don't think at, at seven years old you really understand the the seriousness of what occurred, you know? Right. So, And that's what you remember, that, that you probably didn't know what was going on or how serious it was? Yeah, basically. And, you know, I think it was probably my first real introduction to even knowing what the Middle East really was. That, um you know, and 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 because of the uh, what goes on in the Middle East today, I mean, it's become a huge part of what kids learn in school now. Right, that's since right. post post two thousand and one, because before that, I don't think there was a lot in the curriculum about the Middle East. No, no oh, are you kidding me? I mean, I'm forty <laughs> years old, so i i was I was your age right around um, the time that Ronald Reagan just took over as president. And nobody talked. There was nobody knew nothing about the Middle East. And the only thing we knew about the Middle East was uh, the whole thing with the the uh, the, At the Atola and and our our troops being our uh, Americans being held hostage. Yeah, there was but like four hundred uh, days of hostage. Uh, right, but Reagan yeah. freed him, and everybody says he didn't, and whatever. It's all staged. The but, liberals, right? Right, but fast forward a little bit older when um the space shuttle challenger blew up yeah that's right i mean but i'm talking i was i was around that I was, was 86 i was in third grade third yep so i was in the sixth grade and i mean dude jokes flew around to school about we that. took it serious i mean in third grade uh we had a teacher that wheeled in one of those giant tvs yeah, we were watching it live right right well uh i didn't get to see the explosion live when the explosion happened then she stopped everything, wheeled the the thing in, and and it was a big deal. So we didn't see it live, but I'm sure a lot of people did see it live. So, but I'm just trying to um like map the time frame. Like like uh, you were seven, Scott, and I was ten, eleven when the Challenger blew up. I mean, it's not it's not the same thing by far. No, no, no. But but it's a big event and a child's um you know life and. So then did you have to have this stuff introduced to you throughout the day or throughout the week or throughout the month at seven years old? I mean, how did you start to piece all this together? I mean, I think a lot of it was just the questions I would ask my parents. Uh, 
I mean, I, I, de- we, I definitely remember vaguely um, wa- seeing the news on in basically every t- room in my house when I got home. And, oh, you know, wow. which, um, because, you know, I think everyone was worried. I mean, it was a large amount of people who were killed, you know, or, or you know, or, or I think everyone probably knew somebody who worked in one of those buildings. Yeah, see, you're and, from Boston, so, right? Yeah. You're living in Boston, so so – that's a lot closer to home for you. For me personally, being in Cincinnati, I was kind of more like um, just – I felt like it was an attack on America. I had just gotten out of the military, and and I took that very personally because, you know, when you sign up for the military, you're tra- trained to, to protect the, the country. And so a, an attack like that had to feel very similar to the way the World War II veterans must have felt right after Pearl Harbor. I'm, I'm sure of it. So in your case, you had a more of a personal connection with the fact that, I mean, a lot of those, what, at least two of those planes flew out from Boston, didn't they? Uh, I believe, yes, they did. Wow. So um, your parents, is that I mean, it's something that's been sticking in my mind? You're a conservative. You're fairly young. And I'll tell you what, it's, it's not, not unique. I'm starting to see a trend. But would you say that your parents were a big influence on your political views, or did you just? Get yeah, them? I would say definitely that they have. I grew up in a, a conservative Republican family, but not but not necessarily socially conservative, more more fiscally conservative. And um, you know, I mean, I've grown up in a very accepting environment, but I grew up around um, kind of Republican values. Yeah, it's, I mean, I I would think Massachusetts itself is pretty. It's always oh, a blue state, right? Well, then you know the thing with Mitt Romney introducing socialized uh, medicine. Oh, right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. So so do you um in your music and something that uh, uh, a lot of uh, politicians in the past like like folks like uh, Alan West, he's a black uh, military man politician, and at times he's he's gotten angry about music that objectifies women and you know b's and h's and and uh and that kind of thing putting women down or putting women in a bad light black women white men whatever it be would you say that that your music steers away from that in a more positive light or how do you how do you explain that yeah absolutely um i mean i don't put anything demeaning in my music uh you know i try to i try to try to speak the truth about what's going on in the world. Um, and, uh, and that, even that is kind of a new thing to me because before, before Trumpified, I didn't ever write a political song before, nor did I really let my, I'd say my true voice even be heard in some of my music. I mean, I find today the music I'm writing is, is, is very close to how I feel inside. But I think I found a cool way to translate some of my political frustrations into music. Um, nice. So, I mean, it's, yeah, it's been, it's been a really cool thing. Um, and uh, I think a lot of that, to be honest, has to do with Donald Trump deciding to run for president because, honestly, I grew up in Massachusetts and, you know, just like everybody can be so demeaning to Republicans. You know, I felt like... Until Trump ran, I like hid my conservative values in school, you know, um, because you know, you know how the whole. I just, I just find a lot of liberal people. They just, they try to demean other political parties or affiliations, you know. Yeah, they're almost like and, immature, uh, right? <laughs> it's their bull. It, it's immature and it's bullying. And oh yeah, they they'll and, beat they'll beat you down into submission until you agree with them or or mm-hmm. sympathize with them. I got a story for you, Scott. That's kind of funny. So we went. Um, we're, we're kind of in a conservative area, rough. You know, kind of, kind of conservative. I would say it's kind of a mixed bag here. But we went canvassing for the Trump campaign in a very conservative area. And when we would go knock on the doors, our little, uh, our little, uh, we had like an app that would tell us about who they are because they're all registered people. Um, so they they had voted before, so there's data on them, and so you kind of see what kind of. Um, whether they're registered Republican, whether they're hard conservatives, hard liberal, whatever. And so like every single door we went to, it said registered Republican and they lean hard, hard conservative, almost every door. And when we would talk to them, we would introduce ourselves as canvassing for the Republican Party. 
And when we would ask them if they would take a survey they, and they said yes, and we asked them if they were voting for Trump, they, they acted very reluctant to tell me that. And then when we would ask them if they would like to have a Trump sign in their front yard, they would uh, – most of them would decline. A, a couple of them would say OK. So even – as a person, a conservative person in a conservative neighborhood being canvassed by conservatives, they're just so worried about uh, almost like getting bullied. And it, it's just – it's the weirdest thing. And, and Democrats it on is. the other side are like and, proud and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and that's – I mean I think – I don't think even anybody thought of it really as bullying until Trump came into – into the picture because uh you know i think i think this this liberal bullying type thing has been going on for so long i think we've all kind of become used to it as yes, the norm absolutely but now now i think you know with trump we're in an actual political revolution where where we're voicing our opinions again i mean you know i spent all my high school grade school all that like not even ever speaking my beliefs because i just feel like a lot of education today just is spent on uh, just bashing non socialistic ideas yeah i would say that you know i've been paying attention to it and brian and i have young children that are starting to kind of come up through the school nowadays and we're shocked to find that it seems like the curriculum is largely just propaganda for the democrat party and the thing is is not a lot has changed I would venture to guess that when we went through school, there was it, maybe it wasn't as obvious, but there was definitely probably the same kind of curriculum. So I think that this whole Department of Education thing has been used as a as propaganda to get uh, kids to uh, be indoctrinated into the Democrat Party for many many years. Like even Glenn Beck, who you know he's kind of turned into kind of an idiot when it comes to politics. He, When he talks about the Department of Education, he says that this kind of propaganda has been going on for 100 years, and it wouldn't surprise me to find that out. So I guess uh, you remember going through that. See, we we didn't learn about this fact until years later, but you got to see it firsthand while you were in school. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I, I mean, I don't think really – Pre nine eleven per se, I don't think the the curriculum was quite as propaganda. Wow! So you think you know? You think that the nine eleven actually made it worse? Yeah, I totally do. Oh, um, wow! You know, I I remember having to do geography map, like uh, drawing out maps of the Middle East, and then having for tests to memorize where every Middle Eastern country was. What? Just stupid wow. stuff like that. Just, and, that, that, and honestly, um, I found that, so I repeated eighth grade to go to a private school and I found, I mean, my education, like how I was as a student skyrocketed the minute I went to a private school. Like I made high armor roll the first semester there, but in public school, I was getting like B minus grade C plus like there's just the, the common core education is just a joke. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't work. I mean, as soon as I had, a, I wasn't in a class with 40 kids and I was in a class with only 10 or even less, you know, I, I ex just started skyrocketing as a student. And uh, I mean, common core education is just terrible. So I take it you would be for what I what I've been for and been advocating for a long time that schools should just pretty much be privatized with um, me personally. I'm like, okay, vouchers, because there are, there are schools out there that are expensive and some of them are more prestigious. And I, I do believe that a poor, like a poor family shouldn't be excluded from really good schools. So I'm kind of more of a voucher type guy. I don't know what you think about that. I've never thought about it that way. I mean, that might work. Yeah. I mean, um, they were doing vouchers a lot, starting with George W. Bush and then um, as soon as Obama got into the uh, presidency, he tried to eliminate it in the D.C. area. And strangely, uh, large populations of minority parents were back. Pro yeah, they were protesting that. Like, no, don't take away our vouchers. And then he, I think he ended up not taking it away a after a lot of protests. So, um, so going back to 9-11, um, one thing that you may not have experienced because of your age at the time, and I was wondering what, if you did or didn't or what you might have thought, do you remember what the world was like? You would have been like five and six years old before 9-11, and did you have much of an opinion on that? Because there is a stark 
big there's a, a a bold line as far as I'm concerned having been 25 at the time so what was the question oh did you did, did you notice a a difference in the world as as you viewed it before 911 and then after 911 like a difference between it the world yeah i totally did i remember um it was uh, i think only a couple one or two days after 911 there was or the that that weekend or whatever, there was like a fair going on in my town, and uh, I remember it was the, the first weekend after nine eleven, and uh, I mean this this fair was almost empty. Like this thing would have normally been, this thing would have been packed, you know, with everybody in the town, and it was just like every, people were like afraid to go outside. And then I remember. Um, it was literally it was right after nine eleven. I was at when I was seven and I remember I'm a huge, I love, I've always liked Neil Diamond. So my mom took me to see that at the um, fleet center at the time in Boston at the big, the stadium. And uh, I remember um, sitting there at the concert, like, like just hoping that there was no terrorist stuff that happened, you know, like I remember just being really scared as a little kid um, and, you know, not knowing if, if they would try to like, you know, knock the entire stadium down, you know, blow it up, oh, whatever. Yeah. Um, and I remember just it, 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 that whole nine eleven thing causing a lot of anxiety, but I think it caused a lot of anxiety for millions of people. Definitely. You know, to this day, I go to the Indy 500 every year and they have 500,000 fans that show up and it seats like 300,000 or something like that. And then of course there's a, a bunch of other people that are just all over the stadium area. And to this day, ever since 9-11, I, I'm just always looking around and thinking, oh, I feel like such a sitting duck. But I, I suffer through it anyway, just, and every year, like, I feel like I, I dodged another bullet, you know, and it's just, it's sick that way. But prior to 9-11, I feel like it was kind of a blissfully ignorant time where it's not that the threat wasn't there. I mean, the, the terrorists have been trying to take down the Twin Towers since 1993 and obviously before then. Um, but, it, you know, the first actual attack on it was 93. And then uh, so the threat was always there. But, you know, there was just, you know, that post Gulf War era where um, we were just living the life and everything was peaceful and everything was happy. I was in the military. You know, when I was in the military from 94 to 98, everybody around me, we all were like, we just knew that combat was not in our future at all. That was that was just common knowledge for all of us. And then the, you know the world changed on nine eleven, and and um, you know it's it's a shame that that it, it had to go down that way. So, um, to your music, um, what do you what what kind of music? You said it was kind of pop like music. Um, yeah. What what are your influences? Neil I mean, Diamond. my big, so my two biggest, I do love Neil Diamond. Yeah, but my no, two big, I love him too. I, I think that's awesome that you're 22 and uh, you love, because my dad, my dad was a big Neil Diamond really? fan and all of Neil I Diamond's. I love a lot of old, I love old, I mean, I love like the Allen Brothers. Oh, wow. Um, wow. I love Janis Joplin. Oh, wow. Um, so you like that, like the classic rock era. Yeah, well, I'm more into like the bluesy soul southerny type. Dude, we area, could yeah. do. We could hang out all oh, night. Yeah. Long. Brian loves all that kind of. Stuff. I mean, do I do like, too. Do you, do you know? Do you know the band Government Mule? Yes, I do actually. That's that's my favorite band. Nice. Well, good choice, yeah. man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I love. I mean, Susan Zadeski is another one of my biggest influences. So you did a cover of a Michael Bolton song that you posted up on YouTube uh, a couple months ago or something like that. Yep. And and the way you sang that is actually incredible. And I could see why. Uh, I don't know. How did the Wu-Tang Clan find you? Did you seek them out or did they discover you somewhere? Yeah, so I was – I remember I was in high school and I, I went to this just random open mic night uh, oh. in, in, in the city – and the club ended up being owned by the VP of Wu Tang management, Jimmy Kang. And nice. he was just like he's like he just was in awe, like you know, shocked. Oh, yeah, when you listen to that Michael Bolton cover, I was pretty shocked. 
Um, yeah, you know, you got you. a big, you got a big range, and you have a pleasant sounding voice. And I was wondering on on your Trump song, do you have that? Can we play that? Or do you have it queued up or no? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Brian's kind of he got a little <laughs> bit uh, sidetracked on the computer there. Um, yeah, no, I got that right. Yeah, yeah, let's play a little bit of that. If you got it, unless they're oh it's, uh, queuing up. We yeah, we got a 15 second commercial that we will <laughs> sit through. Yeah, Brian, <laughs> Brian's queuing it up on the old YouTube, so course we got inundated with uh commercials but um and there we go. oh it's a marine commercial okay there's a five thousand dollar fine for americans crossing the canadian border what's nicer than the canadian border i mean if you've got to cross a border if you have your choice between north korea afghanistan or iran i take canada every single time do we agree <laughs> nice. right So that was a little sample. That's um, was that the song that um, that uh, Trump actually played when he came out in New York? Yeah, yeah, that did uh, um, did happen. That was kind of pretty cool. Um, I forget when that was. And just real when quick, that... I apologize. I pulled this up, and, and there's a um, it says Ziploc. Who is who is Ziploc, and what is Ziploc to you? Oh, Ziploc, he, um, I used to do some internet marketing with him, oh, okay. and he's like a funny rapper online, so I, we did a remix of Trumpify together. Oh, okay. I could definitely, definitely hear the influence of Wu-Tang Productions in there. <laughs> and that's the, that beat is like typical like RZA-style stuff that I've heard uh, many, many times before. So, did, <laughs> Now, did you come up with the, the music, or did somebody else? Do you have a producer do that? Um, I mean, I have a ton of different producers, but I, I wrote all the lyrics and oh, okay. did the melodies, and um, I did a lot of the mixing of the song as well. So I actually have a lot of um, a hip-hop background, just my preference when I was young, listening to music coming up. And so I can definitely hear a difference between New York-style rap, hip-hop, and, and like a West Coast style. And I definitely... Definitely hear the New York style in there, so um, that's kind of interesting. And that hip, that hip hop, that era, that missed me. It's really strange. It missed me by like what two years, right? So I don't know how 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 well versed you are in the history of hip hop, but like I was at the perfect age. I was, um, well, I was in junior high when all the late '80s rap started coming out, and then I was probably a sophomore in high school when. Uh, uh, Dr. Dre, the chronic came out. So, so I was just like listening to nothing but all rap during that time. Now, Brian being just a couple years older than me, he was like, he missed all that stuff. You were right. like more of, you know, listening to just the rock and the classic rock and all that kind of stuff. But, um, so, so you got, um, have you met the entire Wu-Tang clan? Yeah. Yeah. I have. I, the past few summers I've toured, opening for the Wu-Tang Clan oh, wow. uh, at a bunch of shows. Um, I mean, it's honestly very rare to, I mean, I've never actually, they, they're never all in the same room together, even on oh, their European not. tour last <laughs> summer. They, like, they never have everybody together. Like, I've met all of them, but not all at the same right. time. Because I don't, it's just, I don't know. It's all a little weird. Well, old Dirty Bastard um, died several years ago, right? ODB. Yeah. So yeah, he, he did. So I'm assuming you did, you you didn't you weren't involved. I know I never met him, but I I am I'm pretty good friends with his son. Oh okay. Uh, yeah, he actually goes by Old Dirty Bastard Junior. Junior, <laughs> okay. It should be Young Dirty Bastard, right? Well, you would think. He, well, he he that's what he was going by, but I think he's trying to. I think he's trying to change it now. O D B J R or something like that. Oh my god. Yeah, gosh. I don't know. That's funny. Um so you met Method Man and all them? He he was probably the most popular one. Uh, yeah, Method Man. Um 
I don't know if you heard my new song that just came out too. It's uh, a couple about three weeks ago. It's called Beautiful Intelligence. I did with Method Man's nephew Intel, who is, um, Intel is actually the son of you, God. Oh, okay. I never knew that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's just so um, many of them. The only reason I can name most of them is because uh, in in the original single Method Man, he he names them all in the beginning, or at least a a, a big portion of them. The uh, uh, Ghostface Killer and all them, all the, all those guys. It's <laughs> the the Rizza, the Jizza, Old Dirty Bastard, Inspect the Deck, Raekwon, the Chef, You God, Ghostface Killer, and the Method Man, or something like that. I mean, there's probably several more, right? Yeah, like three hundred of them or something. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So, um, are you going to try to come out with an album or anything? Yeah, um, right now I'm working on an EP. Um, and then I'll have an, uh, and then at the same time, I mean, I am working on material for an album, but I'm definitely putting on an EP first. I hope to have it out, um, around right, hopefully right before Christmas time, but if not right in the new year, it's just crazy how quickly the end of the year sneaks up on you. Oh yeah. Well, is there a reason why you have to get it out by then? Is it kind of like a, you're Industry trying to hit, type thing? yeah, is it, you're trying to hit like a target date for a reason? Is is it sell uh, better? Like, it's more as basically, you know, after after Thanksgiving, I mean, the whole kind of entertainment industry seems, at least in the music industry, just seems to kind of shut down. Like, everybody just starts getting ready <laughs> for Christmas. And oh, uh, then, you know, wait. So it's like the music industry doesn't even really pick back up until, like, January 15th or 16th. Wow. It's kind of, it's weird. Um, it's like, it's just winter break for them, I guess, right? <laughs> Yeah. You know, yeah. back in so the day when... It's, when it's, oh, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, that's why it doesn't make... Like, if you can't get your album out within, like, November sometime, like, it's not even worth really putting out in December because, I mean, none of the labels will really even be pushing or, or, or and people in the entertainment industry aren't even really looking at, you know, stuff. Well, you know, it's back in the day... Uh... Everybody, all the kids wanted CDs, and before that, it was tapes and albums yeah. and whatnot. And so, a big part of the industry was getting those sales. And w as a kid, I remember one of the things they would ask you what you wanted for Christmas, and uh, a lot of times kids would ask for a particular. Um, I'd CD. like an eight track, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know nothing about no eight tracks, but uh, uh, yeah. So, um, so I would imagine that back in the day, that there was a big uh, target date to make sure that you're your CD was out produced and in the shelves before probably Thanksgiving. Probably before Thanksgiving. Yeah. Right. That's what it seems like. I mean, I, I pretty sure almost all new Christmas songs are released around October, November. Cause it's uh, the problem also is, is a holiday season. is such a short season. It's like, if you have a song you're trying to push and it's about Christmas. Like the minute Christmas is over, almost no one's going to want to hear it, and then you have to wait a whole another year. Are you going to do what all the other big names do and come out with a whole, like a, a dedicated Christmas album? I hope to at some point. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'll tell you uh, what. If you do, <laughs> if you do, my wife and my girls who are uh, eight and seven. They listen to Christmas music all year, <laughs> all the whole year. round, the whole I, year. I, yeah, it's May. I'm out in the backyard working, putting something together, and all of a sudden, I hear jingle bells. Oh, that's <laughs> hilarious. Does your wife does your wife enjoy Christmas music all year round? Yes, she does. <laughs> well, that's that's insane. I, like I can turn see it off. For, I can see for your your kid, little kids, but. <laughs> oh, I love uh, Christmas music, but my brain will make me shut it off if it's <laughs> if it's if it's January first through. Um, I might go as early as November fifteenth, but if it's not in within, you know, November fifteenth to to December thirty first, my brain will make me shut it off. Oh yeah, I have a meltdown. Yeah. <laughs> It's like no, it's the wrong time. It's the wrong time. But uh, other than that, if it's during the season, I love it. Like I like the Frank Sinatra stuff and all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, I do too. Yeah, I hate that one, um, Feliz Navidad. I'm done. I always have to change the channel. I can't take that one. Anymore. Guys, I'm done with that. Well, yeah. we had to sing it when I was in elementary school. And so did yeah, we. we did too. <laughs> we did too. <laughs> except when, except except when, uh, by the time I was in elementary school, and we did the little holiday music thing where the parents came and saw us sing right i remember 
that was when the country clearly was becoming more, trying to be more and more politically correct. So we had to sing like a song for Kwanzaa, a song for Hanukkah, like a yeah, song for every yeah. time. Yeah. Oh, I got a sad story for you. Um, before you go sad. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Before go ahead. you go sad, what about Festivus? Festivus? What's yeah. that? I love Festivus from Seinfeld. Right, Festivus <laughs> for the rest of us. Oh. <laughs> yes. Well, so, so... Okay, on a somber note. Seinfeld, yeah, the, the, the best show. Right, right. So the, the, we have a big Air Force Museum here, the uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Museum, huge up in Dayton. And... Um, you know, it's actually a base, and so it's, you know, lots and lots of service people there. And they held a Christmas concert, or I guess they would call it a holiday concert, every year. And it's pretty prestigious, and it was free. You just had to get the tickets before they were gone, which is like three hours. But um, they did this for years and years, and when you would go, because it's a government entity, um, they did all the traditional Christmas songs, but then they would throw in something for, um, you know, the Jewish religion. And then there was, there may have even been some Islamic stuff in there. Uh, you weren't really sure. You just, it sounded like a, a nice song, whatever, but it was all in there. It was a great program. And then, um, like two years ago, they just you shut this. it down. Right. Obama shut it down. Nothing. <sighs> Absolutely. They, That's what I was going to say is. Is I don't even think um, the elementary schools do holiday oh, sing along things anymore. So I think they, you know, they take away anything to do with. I don't know. It's just crazy weird. Well, I don't know about when you were a kid, but I can tell you this: when when Donald Trump says we're going to make America great again, it's not what Bill Clinton, a racist, said, which was, "Oh, you the people in the white people in the South know what it means to make America great again." Fifty years ago, they want all the white people to have all the the power and all the minorities, you know, whatever he said. Dude, was that ridiculous. was projection. That, that it was, was projection. His, that was yeah. from him in his mind from back in the day. Me personally, I remember going to a, a public school and before. Uh, uh, we started every day. We all stood up and did the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag as a whole. Yeah, class. we did too. Oh, you did do that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so yeah. When I, I think apparently, of me- apparently they don't do it anymore. Oh no, 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 no! Absolutely not. <laughs> they do not, and it's a, it's really sad because. And you know, oh, keep going. No, no, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm listening. Oh, I was just saying, um, I have a childhood friend who's now a third grade teacher, and she told me they even now took um, cursive out of teaching. Like, kids are going to grow up now without knowing how to do cursive. Okay, okay check that out. On, this, on that note, and I, I normally don't talk about homeschooling that much, but I'll, I'll throw it out there. Once My kids are homeschooled, and my wife didn't think she could do it because she wasn't uh, – she graduated from L.A. Unified, which, if anybody knows – from sixth to seventh grade, the kids that move on to seventh grade, fifty percent of those will drop out. Ew. That's LA Unified. Yikes. So she didn't know if she could do it or not, but she got with the curriculum. She got with a good one, a real conservative one that uses books that are a hundred years old. You know, they use the teachings nice. of the old school and the old ways. And so my daughters are now reading and writing and everything. And I showed them, uh, you know some stuff I wrote real quick and they're like, Oh, we haven't studied that yet. And this is a couple of years ago. Oh, we haven't studied that yet. I'm like, well, you're going to do it. Right. So, Oh yeah. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to do the cursive. So, I mean, all those things are being lost. Oh, and they're also, they, they're getting into the, the, the heritage of, of America, the founding fathers, all the really good things that made America what it is. They made, I, found, I honestly found those the, those mer- those lessons in school to be the most boring. <laughs> <laughs> they can't, like, yeah, I, they wanted, like, you they, know what you know what part of it is is I grew up right next to Concord, Massachusetts, right where the Civil War oh, stuff right. took place, and so I'm surrounded by tourists coming every all year, like thinking this is all the cool thing. It's like I've heard this stuff since I was like not even born. I think. Right, right. Well, something else that. <laughs> It's not a conspiracy. It's it's a fact. The government is, with Common Core, is trying to implement a situation where kids don't like to read because they force them to read boring things. Or the teacher will, and I've had this in college, where professors will put things out there to you. Oh, this is really boring. You're not going to like it, but i got to do it. And so they do it half-assed. And 
you assume the opinion of your professor or your teacher. Right, yeah. And it's just, it's sad because good teachers can make boring subjects. That's right. Awesome. That's right. That's true. And, and it could be math. I had an exciting math teacher when I was in high school, and uh, he made calculus uh, kind of interesting, believe it or not. How about that, Scott? Calculus. <laughs> uh, I, I, oh, I, I don't, math is just. High school math sucks. <laughs> I know. No, I'm with you. It's just when you get one that just kind of gets into it and tries to figure out how to how to make it interesting for high school kids, it actually – you probably had a bad math teacher. <laughs> okay. I did, but I actually had a – actually, yeah, he was kind of bad. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, real quick, um, we're going to kind of wrap it up in the next five minutes, but we're on with, uh, with, uh, with Scott Isbell, I-S-B-E-L-L. You can Google it. He comes up at the top. His homepage is there. Uh, Twitter is Scott Isbell underscore, because apparently somebody stole that. Yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah, I remember the last interview Bunch I did creeps. with you. Um, you said that somebody somebody stole it, but then uh, abandoned it, right? It's just not even being used. Yeah, it hasn't been. No one's been on it since, like, 2013. <laughs> well, that's, that's actually kind of cool, because then people will look at that and say, oh, well, there ain't nothing going on here, versus... Uh, people with, uh, ha, you know, at Donald Trump. Well, you've been verified, right? You have the blue check mark. Yeah, I do. Well, that's good. Yeah. That's good. So for young kids that are coming up, and I know, uh, you know, that uh, America's Voice or Teens Got Talent uh, things, uh, as you can tell, I'm not into that stuff. But for, <laughs> for ki- I've got daughters now. They're into that. They're into that. So I've got to act like I'm into that. <laughs> for kids growing up now that are young in grade school that are starstruck and have their eyes. Oh, I want to sing. And they sound like cats on the, on the, on a hot tin roof. Um, yeah. What kind of advice would you give them or what would you say to, well, what if they really do have talent? What would you say to them? Course, I mean, I'd course. say if for a little kid, I mean, I, yeah, I'd say go pursue your dreams, but the reality is the music industry is full of, like pieces of crap pretty much mm. same you way know, with hollywood yeah i mean it's it's not you really have to i mean i do it because i love i love what i do but i mean i put up with some just stupid stuff every day it's just you know just constant drama over nothing and and i don't know would, you have to be insane to be in it but i wouldn't tell that to a little kid <laughs> and i saw somebody on uh commenting on something you had up that said you should do uh, what is it, the, the the voice or whatever, America's Got Talent and all that. Do you ever think of doing any of that, or does the Wu-Tang production sell you don't do that? I mean, I've thought about it. It's just, I don't know. I, I Sometimes I'm just a little creeped out by some of those shows. <laughs> um, you right. know, it's almost like, I don't know, they, they cut a lot of really good, I don't know. I've just kind of been focused on, on trying to create my own stuff and, um I mean, uh, I have a couple of TV show opportunities coming up. One Good. for Vice TV, um, I just got. Um, and that starts, uh, I think, the filming. They're going to come to Boston uh, in the next two to three weeks. Something I'd like to throw out there, I mean, I, I, just because I'm a little bit older, but I, I think what you're doing is phenomenal and it's awesome. And something that I had to learn was not chase it, not chase them, the people that – that could help me yeah. like the, like the, uh, the, your, the, the voice America's got talent. I, I feel like people who do that are, are chasing it versus just being it. Like with us here at Smith radio, we never chased anybody down. We just three years ago said, man, we've got to do this and do it now. Three years later, you know, we're living it, not chasing it. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. I, yeah. And I don't know. It's just a lot of those American Idol shows, like for the most part, even the the winners usually just disappear completely. It's bizarre. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. true. A lot of it has to do with the horrible contracts that they rope them contracts, into. Contracts, yeah. Yeah. There's a buddy of mine that I work with. His son made it to here in Cincinnati, made it to one of the high ranks in that show and got the ticket to go to L.A. or really? wherever they go. Okay. And they're very devout Christians. They're not uh, not glamour, not glitzy, nothing like that. But the kid was phenomenal. He was so good. I think, and he built his own guitar 
and Simon Cowell came up and played it, or they played around with it because he was amazed at what he built. But even he said, I saw the monster. Oh, yeah. I saw how dirty it was going to be, and he just walked away from it. Yeah. So it sounds like you're kind of doing it your own way where you got your YouTube thing, which is kind of like a self, you know, you're doing it yourself. You kind of got uh, discovered by Wu-Tang uh, at, a, at an open mic and everything like that. And I would imagine that you're probably in better hands with them than some of the, the uh, vultures out there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I mean, I've I've taken a long time to build my team, um, but uh, I mean, speak. What well, funny you mentioned YouTube? Um, I've actually so in February after I put Trump fight out, I got hacked by some Trump protesters who literally took over all my social media. They deleted every YouTube video I ever had. Oh, no. I lost like I lost like seventeen or eighteen million views, and uh, so I. They, I never got my face. I still don't even have access to my Facebook fan page. Um, oh, and I've contacted Facebook countless, countless times. I've contacted Google countless times. And neither has ever bothered to help me because well, they, they see that I'm – Right. They won't. And it's, it's, <laughs> so, I mean, I'm just – I really need to find ways to expose that because, that, I mean, that it's just – it's crazy and how – That's what we do here. I mean, obviously, I, I've been uh, on super secret probation – <laughs> multiple, multiple times right. to where I can see the Facebook uh, page or Smith Radio page, but I can't, I can't do anything with it. I can't add, take away. I can't like. I can't nothing. We were suspended from YouTube for a really long time for like almost a year. Yeah, really, really long time. <laughs> Why? Yeah. Oh, because, well, I mean, it's questionable, but at there was that I behead, did it. it was I a did. beheading video, and it was, <laughs> but it wasn't. It didn't show. It didn't show the actual beheading. It showed a before where the guy was talking and he had the guy. And then they showed the after where there was a body with a head on top of the body. It's a slideshow. And I said, well, wait a minute. This could be done by Hollywood. Oh, and we believe it really so, was done by Hollywood. Right, right. So our, our narrative was that we don't think that this is real. We think that this is fake. And they took it as, hey, you... You posted a beheading video, so you're suspended. And we were like, come on, that's not a beheading. It's probably fake. But and then, anyway. And Facebook did me in because I started railing against Islam uh, during France. Oh, they don't like that at During all. the whole thing in France. No, they hate that. They yes, hate that. Yes, they really do. I mean, I, you know, I never got my Instagram back either because it's owned by Facebook. So I created a new one. And I noticed the, that whenever I post photos on there, they purposely are skewing it so nobody ever sees. I used to get thousands of likes on oh, my posts. That's called shadow banning. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm telling even like close family friends and things who always like everything, they don't even see what I post. Oh. So I just don't even use it. So I don't, I don't even care about it. All I wow. use is Twitter, Twitter, Snapchat. SoundCloud and YouTube, but, you know. And I other than that, you have about uh, as many uh, followers on Twitter as your average uh, celebrity. Almost, uh, you're you're pushing what eight hundred thousand or so? Yeah, I think about like seven hundred and twenty thousand or so, something. Okay. Yeah, I mean that's awesome, and we hope that that continues Thanks. to grow. Yeah, that's awesome. yeah, I I love to hit a million soon. And I mean, so after the sh- after the show is live, it this show will be uploaded to iHeartRadio. And so as soon as that – that will happen sometime later on this evening. And as soon as that happens, I'll shoot that link over to you so that you can – Great. Yeah, I can tweet that out and awesome. we'll get it. Yeah. Shout out to and, uh, and then I'll uh, – and then I'll also ha- – I'll force Bill Mitchell to retweet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes uh, sometimes he doesn't ever see his tweets. I think he turns all of his notifications off because <laughs> – I think he does too. I think – yeah, I don't know. Yeah, one, I don't t- think one he, time I texted him. I said, uh, "This is a text to his phone." I said, "Hey, here's a link to a tweet. Can you retweet it?" <laughs> <laughs> it never happened. <laughs> oh, that's ridiculous, <laughs> Scott. It's been awesome. I really appreciate you calling in. We'd love to having you on, and certainly don't be a stranger. We'd yeah. love to have you on more. Absolutely, um, and yeah, helping anytime. you out and helping out the cause. You know, right? And the cause is is freedom, freedom on the internet, freedom in America, freedom for all. Everybody to say what they want and do what they want and to not be shadow banned. What the <laughs> hell? Exactly. Exactly. I appreciate you guys having me on. And uh, seriously, anytime you want me on, I, I can come on. Not Great. a problem. Excellent. Oh, and awesome. I'm going to go ahead. We'll, we'll, we'll cut off the call and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to lead out with your song, Beautiful Intelligence. All right, bud? 
Awesome. Thanks. You're welcome, right, Scott. Take care. One. All right. Bye. Bye. All right. So here's the song, his newest song, a single, but then cut an album yet called Beautiful Intelligence. This message will be saved for 21 days. Yeah. Your boy Intel, Scott Isbell. Yeah. Oh. Uh. Yo, you take my breath away, but in a better way. I want you now, tomorrow, and yesterday. See what I meant to say. I like your mind, baby. If loving you was a crime, I'd do the time, baby. I like your whole style. You such a flower child. Pick your face out of a crowd with your gorgeous smile. So please stay a while and let me rap to you. You hear my voice and you don't know how to act, do you? Beautiful intelligence, down to earth elegance. Junk in your trunk like an unhealthy elephant. Pardon my expression and you caught me off guard and that body so raw let the lord give applause am i feeling you of course i gotta keep it smooth i already love myself so there's no way i can lose my muse mary jane always gets us in the mood call me back baby girl i'll be missing my favorite food come on trying to hide it acting like it's private i know you feeling me so don't you dare go deny it we are on a diet gotta swallow truth you're afraid of losing me like i'm afraid of losing you i'm afraid of losing who i am with myself cause past heartbreaks all the damage was felt i often ask the universe to hand me some help is that you hopefully i play the hands i was dealt usually girls be using me for some jewelry stupidly i would give them things such buffoonery but you could be my diamond in the Sky steady shining in this concrete jungle as a king, never lying, never crying, cause my heart getting colder and colder, but it warms up when you rest upon my shoulder, I hope you call me back, I just wanna know what's up, is it love, is it lust, nah it's both, we doing us baby, yeah. Scott Isbell doing the uh, the mu- the singing part of it. Beautiful intelligence. Yeah, what Very an good. incredible song! You can see, obviously, you can see why the, the Scott is as popular as he is. That that's just great music right there. I'm not into hip hop, but I can tell talent when I see it. I, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll be honest One with you. One of these days, I listen to that again. Well, I, and, I ain't got no problem yeah, with that. The, the, it's the, great. The music is awesome. And um, if if you want to see him show off his vocals, you should look up the. Uh, the, his, he does a cover of a Michael Bolton song that was used in a Disney movie, and he he really blows it up. Okay, so up. so, and uh, here coming up pretty shortly, we're going to have Steve Spell two come back on the show from Louisiana. But until that happens, um, we're talking about, and we just had Scott Isbell on the show, and that song that you just heard was his latest uh, release, his latest song, and um, yeah, no, just just a great kid, great all around. Love Trump, all in for Trump, conservative, uh, created the song Trumpified, which is it's an incredible song. Played it earlier in this hour, but definitely go check him out on YouTube, Facebook, or no, no, YouTube and Twitter and SoundCloud. Yeah, and, he, and he's even though his YouTube was hacked and he hasn't really been back on it much, he, he does have a couple of more recent posts, which you could see him, um, uh, some of his songs. Excellent. So... Um, 
we talked to him about 9-11 and we kind of wrapped that up and um, there's a lot of uh, head analysis, a lot of uh, VIPs, a lot of people in the military um, that run a lot of the government that say right now, six within the last 60 years, we are more vulnerable now to a World War III oh, yeah. than in the last 60 years. Right. I, I could kind of feel that. Dick Cheney railed against Obama this past week. Oh, I missed that. About, yeah, just going to explain that one. Too. Going on and on about how all his policies are just destructive and ripping apart America. Which I mean, we see it, we know it, and some of the newest numbers out for unemployment: one in six men who are able to work are are unemployed. Able-bodied men. Right. They say those numbers are worse than the Great Depression. For Able body men. That's um, that's the problem with America right now. You know, we need people who are able to produce to produce. And for those of you that are like, hey, why you got to work us like slaves? <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> and this is an interesting thing that should be pointed out. Um, the Bible is correct when it says, when God says, if you don't work, if you don't labor, you starve, and you starve, and you die. Right. And so, we, we are to labor all the days of our lives. Right. And so what what you can get from that is you can't fight that, okay? You can't fight that. When people aren't working, then the people that are working are working on their behalf, and that's why they're able to survive. And it's not fair to people who are working to have to support able body people who are able to work for themselves and survive um f- you know on you know to do that for them when they could do it themselves and when we live in a country in a society where able body people cannot find work there's something terribly wrong really terribly wrong i mean it's it's a really sad state in the world when people who are able to work to survive have to be propped up by the government and the government is nothing more than the collection of the society as a whole well not only that but when you have such a large young youth uh and uh crowd or whatever you want to call it not working not being productive not learning how to work not being productive not getting their first you know job their second job working through that you've got a lot of kids staying at home that or in their mom's basement, frustrated, angry, meeting up with other frustrated, angry youths, joining uh, groups like Black Lives Matter to terrorize other people. I mean, these kids should be having a job. Well, they shouldn't and, be out terrorizing. Yeah, and, and isn't it true, wouldn't you agree with me, Brian, that I think that everybody has a deep desire to want to have a purpose in life. Oh, absolutely. Having a purpose in life will drive you, will will push you, will make you do things you never thought you could do. I, I mean, look at us here. I mean, I referenced Smith Radio earlier in the show, but I'll do it again. I mean, look at us here. We have a purpose. We have reason. And, and we know what it is. And we're just... This is just one of the many things that I do, and I feel like I actually – I really have purpose in life. And this – Smith Radio just happens to be the thing that I can propagate um, my thoughts and push a certain philosophy out to the world. And hopefully a lot of people that agree with me would share that by sharing all of our shows and all that kind of stuff. But um, I believe that when you take away somebody's – purpose in life by just saying, oh, well, you don't have to work. You can just sit on the couch and collect uh, government checks. Nobody's going to sit around for that. They're going to find purpose in life. They'll find something to do. Right. Right. And if that means joining a terrorist organization like um, Al-Qaeda or ISIS or – I mean we have people in America who are going overseas to join ISIS. How does that make any sense whatsoever? There was a girl They're trying to find purpose in life. A college girl that went over to see overseas to 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 join ISIS, and at one time was screaming for the American government to intervene to bring her back, and that never happened, and they never found her. Yeah, they end up getting murdered and stuff like that. And then you have uh, young black Americans who 
not only do they have nothing to do because uh, there's no jobs for them, but they can't they can't find work even if they want to find work. Right. There's nothing for them, and they're kind of they grow up in an environment where everybody around them projects the fact that there is going to be no work for them. You know, imagine growing up a young black man. He might uh, live in a neighborhood where maybe it's mostly black. Oh, we have a phone call. Oh, that would Who be Steve that? Spell. That would be Steve Spell. Good evening, Steve Spell. You're on with Smith Radio with Brian Smith and Carrie Smith. How you doing? I'm all right. I'm all right. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. We are Good. we are talking about and, and transitioning into this whole Hillary thing, but we just finished up talking about 9-11, and we're talking about the youth that are un- unemployed and starting to find um, purpose and whether it be a gang-related organization, a terrorist organization, kind of things like that. Um, and then we're going to head over to Hillary, and if she's elected, how those youths will continue to be enslaved. But um, before we get, get to that, Steve, do you remember exactly the moment, I know you do, where you were when 9-11 happened? Yes, of course. Of course, yes. I was... I was when I woke up, I woke up to the to the news. It was on every news channel. Oh, that's right, so because I, I you're remember. you're in Central Time Zone. Oh, right. So it was earlier for you. Yes, I, I woke up to the news, and so when I when I got up and got to stirring around, I turned the TV on, and and I didn't turn it off for the next uh, fifteen years. I've been watching <laughs> everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Seriously, seriously. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm just just on the edge of my seat ever since because that's how screwed up. Uh, everything has gotten right uh, so, so we're 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 on with steve spell too and steve i know that you're on twitter however i think your your biggest crowd is on facebook is that right yes that is that, that is absolutely right okay and where can folks find you when they go to facebook uh, donald trump media tracker is is my page all right and excellent. i have that donald trump media tracker and steve spell too Okay. And number two. All right. Awesome. And so now, um, when you went through and you were watching nine eleven, what did it, what did it mean for you? Some folks are saying that you know it was isolated, New York only, and I feel for New York, but I I kind of have the sense that you might have a different opinion on that. No, I took it personally. I mean, they they may as well have had set a bomb off at my kid's school. I, I took it extremely personally. And I think that a lot of Americans did as well. It wasn't just a New York, a New York thing for me. It was an America thing. And so, uh, and, and when the New York Times, I'll tell you, when the New York Times ran Osama bin Laden's, they put Osama bin Laden's speech on the front page of the New York Times because Osama bin Laden shortly afterwards made a speech. And so the New York Times transcribed that speech. And what struck me and in, in what Obama, Osama bin Laden said was that now that the sword has come to America, for the sanctions that against our people, basically, how do you feel about that? And so that's when I knew right then that sanctions were just as bad as anything else in terms of um, of, of starting a war because they Osama bin Laden said that they attacked us because of sanctions. But that's how I know sanctions don't work. You may as well just go to war. Right. That's so, interesting. Well, now, yeah. okay, think about this then, and I'm not going to get off uh, off topic, but uh, a couple things that happened this week. Even with the sanctions with Iran, and they still got, they're saying up to $33 billion. There's some insane numbers out there. Those sanctions don't work either because Obama isn't even abiding by sanctions. Well, they're just giving them money. Right. Yeah, but if my point is that if the enemy views the sanctions as an act of war, you, you may as well just go. Just go to yeah, so, that, that's, so you want to cut out the middleman. I, I definitely can can get on board with that, yeah. And I don't necessarily, I'm not advocating war. What I'm advocating is a different policy because sanctions don't work. They, they hit us on 9-11 because of sanctions. And that's straight from the horse's mouth, Osama bin Laden. Hmm, interesting. So so they look, view it as we struck them first with the sanctions. Yeah, Osama bin Laden's speech, he said, and it was on the front page of the New York Times. Right. It, it's easily yeah, access. When Osama bin Laden made a, a speech on, on, on video, he came out and said that sanctions were starving his people to death. They view them as an act of war. So, you know, that's why I, I, I learned 15 years ago that sanctions weren't working. And now 15 years later, we're still getting hit. They're obviously not working. 
Right. Are you satisfied with um, what has been happening in the past 15 years with regards to our response to 9-11 and everything? No, we, we haven't fixed the problem yet. I mean, would you, the, the, BP is a good example. If, if that hole was still in the bottom of the Gulf blowing oil, would, would you be satisfied? I mean, the, the, <laughs> right. Think about it. The problem has not been fixed, so there's no way I, I've, I've achieved a level of satisfaction. It, 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 we're still having these terrorist attacks on our own soil. Right, and intelligence analysts are saying now, they came out with this report last week saying now that we are more – we have – we are more vulnerable now than we have ever been in the last 60 years. Yikes. That's sad. That's sad. Right. And Dick Cheney came out with an article blasting Obama for ripping down um, everything that was put up for protection-wise, if you will, whether it be um, rules, regulations, things like that, uh, bringing in all these refugees. Now they're saying by the end of 2016, there'll be 127,000 refugees, mostly children, in this country, that's like uh, using your BP analogy. That would be like going down there and blowing the hole bigger. Yeah, but and, and, and you know that's a that, that's a lot of mosques. They're going to be building a lot of mosques. I mean, you know, I'm not knocking mosques. I'm just telling you, get ready because with their faith comes their churches and their chapels, and it's and the fact that we're going to have to support these. We have to support these guys. Well, they're yeah, get benefit. Yeah, they're saying that 75 percent of them are, are on full blown. Welfare, food, cash aid, all that stuff. Now, who's going to pay for their mosque? And again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not knocking a mosque, but who's going to pay for this? Well, you know who's who gonna pay for the they're going to make the work. local, either the local municipality come up with money, say, well, you've got all these churches for Jesus. We need to balance this. We need the government to pay for our mosque. And, and some knucklehead in government will probably sign off on something stupid like that. Which is a violation of church and state, as far as I'm concerned. But whatever. Yeah, um, there's, there's violation. At the, I guess you could look at it this way too. Um, if they were to raise their own money, to you know, just by donations from parishioners or whatever they call them in the Islamic faith, if they're on government subsidies, then in kind of a roundabout way, the government's building the mosques anyway because they're using money that they're getting. From the government to donate to build their mosques. Yeah, and, and you know, we could eliminate all this by just keeping them where they're at. <laughs> the yeah. a, amen. Yeah, amen. Absolutely. So, like, go ahead. I, I was just saying, we could save a lot of money on car insurance if we don't have to write the policy in the first place. <laughs> keep them in Syria. <laughs> keep them in Syria, you know. <laughs> keep them in Syria. They want to be there anyway. Right, I mean, that's their home. Not- yeah, that's their homeland. That's where Sharia law actually lives and breathes. People are enslaved there. They want to give that slavery all around the world. We don't want it. That's part of the caliphate. They want to try to spread as wide as possible. I say you got to contain it. If you put an equal amount of uh, Muslims throughout the world, uh, it would be a lot easier for them to just take over the world, right? Yeah, well, they've, they've been trying to take over the world for a long, long time, 1,500 years. Right. So, you know— this, this is a this is a, a long time they've been doing this, and they're getting better at it, and, and we're getting worse at it. So okay. it, it's really it's, it's discouraging. So what do you think? And I, I know what you think, but I'm just kind of throwing that out there. Okay, Hillary Clinton's running for president. For all of it's us, that, that, no, we know the answer, but go ahead, run with that. No, I'm just saying I, she's going to have uh, she's going to have a hard time running with pneumonia and, and uh, lung collapse every five minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> How many lungs? I, 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 I saw it came across the wire that uh, they're claiming it's uh, pneumonia. <laughs> so. Yeah, and you know, I, 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 I um, there's going to be a point in this election where the media is no longer going to be able to cover up for Hillary Clinton, and that's when the the screws are really going to come out of this thing. And I saw a little bit of that earlier, an indication of that with uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta. I don't know if you ever heard of him on CNN. Yes, yes, I have. He was. Song with Poppy Harlow, and he—you could see it in his face. He was just perplexed, and he said, "This is just very, this is very strange." Because a week ago, they were attributing her coughing spells to allergies. Oh. Now we find out much more serious condition, which is pneumonia. So pneumonia. So you know, um, it's 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 strange they were blaming this on aller- allergies a week ago. And Dr. Sanjay Gupta tends to believe that they should have known it was pneumonia a week ago. 
And well, if that's if that's true, or two weeks ago, why didn't they go ahead and tell us? Well, I think. Do you believe them when they say it's pneumonia? No, I I I, I don't believe anything coming from Team Clinton. <laughs> no. Absolutely, absolutely. No, nothing. It's safe to say don't don't believe anything that's that's coming from Team Clinton. And that's just where we're at in in this race. How I mean, bad? Yeah, but, how bad does her health have to be? that they have to lie by saying she has pneumonia. It's got yeah, it, it, yeah, it's, it's it's, to be exponentially it, bad. It's like, how do we downplay this? Well, let's tell the public that she has pneumonia. They're downplaying it with pneumonia. That's, well, it's really bad for Hillary. I mean, she's fallen into poles. Now she's fallen into parking lots. I mean, she's fallen <laughs> all, oh, man. She's, fall, she's fallen all over the place. She's having a really... She's having a rough time, and this is all true. You right. Know? So she's ha- she's having a, a, a rough time with it, but her health is not good. Her health is not good at all. But we knew that. We we knew right. that. There's a little bit of truth in every in every in every rumor, even in a malicious story. You will find an element of truth. We knew that she wasn't healthy with all of all of the coughing that was going on. Well, I I and, um I like to bring up old news. So, do you think Doctor Drew is vindicated now? Yeah. I, I, Maybe. Well, you heard Maybe. you heard what happened to his show. He it got he came out and said, uh, lot, "Hillary know. Hillary needs to see professionals. And the handlers aren't doing their job. Uh, sh- I believe that she's in grave danger without getting the proper attention." They, he said that she was ha- getting fifties style medical care, right? And then his show was immediately canceled. Yeah, that's and that's sad. So as far as vindication, I have to give him his. They had to give him his show back, but you know, um, <laughs> right. we we know we know that that Hillary Clinton is in poor health. And when you watched her when she at Friday when she came out and did her her um, her news her, her press the faux press conference that she did. Oh, that was her, so her, bad. Yeah, it was so she, bad. She sounded very subdued, like she was trying to hold back a, a massive hacking attack. <laughs> And so, right. <laughs> seriously, she was very subdued. Um, they had her mics way up. She could have whispered, and we would have heard everything that she was saying. And you know, it was. It, I, I I could tell then that 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 she's not in, she's not in good health. I'm telling you guys, uh, she the way she's tripping and falling. I mean, a well placed banana peel on the tarmac would spell disaster. For <laughs> oh man, <laughs> that would be a Trump conspiracy, right? <laughs> Yeah, Trump did it. You know he did it. <laughs> oh, wow. No, here's some. Um, the whole thing with her emails that came up last week uh, with the FBI and the whole hammer, how that she used, uh, somebody used a hammer on the Blackberries and whatnot. And I bring this up because I've got a, a sound clip from uh, the Clinton News Network this week. And this is just how in the bag the Clinton News Network, CNN, is is desperate to try and save this woman. At, at the very beginning of this clip, it's only about 30 seconds long. At the beginning of this clip are two gentlemen that are talking about the hammer, and then you'll hear the interruption of the CNN female um, uh, protectant. <laughs> they destroyed right. blackberries with hammers in the State Department. That's not what won the presidency. Evan, 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 hold on. Can you the fact check that? Hang on, that hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, Evan Perez. Hammers, fact check that for me, please, on the fly. Uh, yes, they did, Brooke. Uh, yeah, <laughs> as uh, <laughs> as they did. you mentioned, there were uh, 13 devices, mobile devices, and five iPads that uh, the FBI said that you know, in some way, were used with with her private email server, and they did, in some cases, just destroy them with hammers when they were done using them. <laughs> did you hear that, Steve? Yeah, <laughs> yeah they they they, they, they can't cover they for her anymore. She, was she no, not? They can't. Go ahead. They they can. I mean, they get a lot of time on their hands if, they, if they're destroying these blackberries with with hammers. And <laughs> I don't on, even was that on CNN, I, uh, Brian? Yeah, that was a CNN clip, and that the the female that, that her show that she was running, she was absolutely perplexed and beside herself. Well, her producers were in her ear saying, "No, no, stop him from talking, stop him from talking." <laughs> and so she tried to interrupt him by saying, "I need that fact checked right now." And then. <laughs> She got totally torpedoed. That was so awesome. Yeah, I, thought, I, I did see that. And I'm telling you now, if you watch Hillary in questions about her health, if you, if you look at her, 
normally when she comes out in public, she'll be wearing these sunglasses. You know, and I, and I believe that's that's to keep her from having these seizures. Mm, oh, well, interesting, I mean, Steve. Yeah, yeah. I had. A, out, hold on one second, real quick. I had a prediction almost a year ago from an old, wise old gentleman that I work with on the side, and and he and I go back and forth with politics, and he's on board with Trump, uh, Trump sign in the yard. And, and I asked him, I said, how long is this going to go? Like, what's going to happen? What's the end? And you know what he told me? He said, as, he said, as soon as you see the sunglasses come back out. Really? It's over. Yeah. My, well, she had the sunglasses on today. Yeah, guys. she, she did. had the sunglasses on today. Mm. Now, I didn't know that. What you just told me is news to me. But I knew that... that, that I already suspected with the sunglasses. I saw her with the sunglasses, and and you know that there's something, there's something up with that, and I think it's related to the concussions that she was having. Oh yeah. Remember, remember she slipped, tripped, and bumped her head, and uh, <laughs> right. yeah, remember that it was a big deal, and and she had a she suffered from a concussion, and she's she hasn't gotten gotten over it yet. She there's no like, reason to believe she's going to get over it in the next. Remember two those months, those black rim quad focals she was wearing or something? They were like really weird looking special glasses. You remember that, Brian? Oh yeah. We were making so much fun of it, and we found out later that that's what you're supposed to wear after you have a really bad concussion or something like that. Yeah, I mean she 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 might want to do a joint venture with the NFL with their study on concussions. I don't know. Maybe there's some, maybe there's something. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's something to be learned there. Well, she she um, did in the emails that were recovered or exposed by WikiLeaks. Hillary Clinton refers to herself as having a cracked head. Wow. Okay. She's talking back and forth in emails with Uma, and she's like, "Yeah, I got this cracked head thing." That's not good. Yeah, I believe it. Uh, and then I believe it. But, but go ahead. You know, I'm telling you. One of the things I find curious about this this diagnosis of pneumonia today, the timing of this, I mean, we're almost up to the debates here, September the 26th. So, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they tried to use this pneumonia as some kind of leverage for the upcoming debates. I'm not sure what, but there, there's more than meets the eye here, and, and we're going to find that out over the coming week. Well, I'm one gonna, thing I think right. we all can agree on is that there is no way that the – debacle that was captured on videotape of her attempting to get into that van was planned well, wouldn't no i mean they were saying that it, she she stumbled uh it yeah. comes to find out she she did a weekend at bernie's thing where she was completely dead to the world not dead physically to the world and literally <laughs> like limp body yeah they they had to drag her in um, Gary Byrne, I don't know if you know who Gary Byrne is. He's the author of Crisis of Character, and he's a former uh, Secret Service agent to Bill Clinton and, uh, I guess, um, also First Lady. Uh, he was with B the uh, Bush the Elder also. But, of course, he was around um, um, Hillary Clinton all the time too. But he said after viewing that videotape that, you know, the Secret Service agents were um, – they needed to support her body 100%, which is why she went down, because they weren't expecting that. Imagine an entire limp body of an adult just collapsing on you when you're not expecting it. Right, 300 pounds law. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's being generous. But, you know. That, this, no, that's it, per trunk. I'm, I'm telling you now, it's, there's a couple of different clips that you can watch, and there's one of them It looks like it, it was shot from an elevated position, and – she she looks – I don't know why they didn't ambulate her. I, I don't know why they didn't ambulate her. Why did they – they tried to – she why did they agree to let her go to the vehicle on her, on her own recognizance? I don't know. She needs a wheelchair. I mean, she needs a chair. She needs a gurney. <laughs> or or a, a stroller. I mean, they need a stroller for Hillary, a wheelchair for Hillary. She should not be made to walk like that. Especially in the public eye, with her health being what it is. Okay. I mean, obviously, she almost, she almost failed. See, okay, know? check this out, Steve. Earlier this week, InfoWars, uh, one of the, the, the young, they're starting to phase out, um, what's his face? Oh, Alex Jones. Alex, they're Alex. phasing Alex Jones out, and they're bringing some new young blood into InfoWars. And one of the girls uh, that announces for him went to Hillary, Hillary Clinton's stop, and it was like... Um, like an outdoor event, and she walked around filming and talking, 
and there was no Hillary anywhere, nobody to be found. There's hardly any, a crowd there at all. And then all of a sudden, and I have no idea why. I know why they did it, but I don't know why it was there. All of a sudden, an ambulance pulls up and wheels a gurney back to the back and just stops. And, like, it's hidden back in the back. Huh. But but that was it. But And that was it. That was done. It was. But did Hillary come? Hillary eventually showed up. Okay. And immediately she went into her hacking fit. Her whole coughing, hacking, hacking. And that's the sound bite where she says, I think a Trump, I got allergic. Oh, oh, so that was the event for that. Okay. That was the so event. So they knew if they had an ambulance there. Let me enlighten both of you guys on this one. One time uh, Dick Cheney was coming to Cincinnati and I made a wrong. I knew he was coming. I And I knew where he was going. He was going to an actual private residence uh, in, a, in a really nice part of town. And I made a, a turn on this street and didn't realize that I was turning on the street where he was having this. It was a dinner. It was a fundraiser dinner. And, of course, the road was like a traffic jam, and I was kind of stuck on it. So I waited. And sure enough, an ambulance showed up. And I immediately called my wife. You know, this was like four years ago or so, right? Or no, eight, 12 years ago, whatever it was. It was a long time. It was back when Dick Cheney was, was vice president. So, um, so yeah, so an ambulance showed up and I said, oh my gosh. So I called my wife who has some connections with the Republican party. And I said, why is there an ambulance showing up to this Dick Cheney fundraiser? Come to find out after she talked to some people that the ambulance shows up to every event Dick Cheney goes to because of his heart condition. Not because, not because he's vice president, not because he might need it, but because he has a pre-existing heart condition and at any time he might need to have emergency medical care. So it makes sense to me in the condition that Hillary's in now that a ambulance would precede her. Why it was not at the World Trade Center is very interesting. Well, there's an ambulance that follows her motorcade, her motorcade around. Where were they this uh-huh. morning? I've, I don't know, but I've, I've seen clips, I've, I've, I've witnessed clips myself of, of her motorcade with an ambulance uh, f- following it. And, you know, I don't know, but it just goes to show you, we just do not have good health care because we don't have ambulances that follow us around here in the South. So uh, whatever kind of insurance plan these guys are on, it, it's really premium, premium. Because well, yeah, she opted out of it's Obamacare. For, it's for the elite. Yeah, yeah. She, she opted out of Obamacare. <laughs> Only for the ruling elite. Yep, yep. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I would like to have that, too. I think we should all have uh, roving ambulances all around uh, so that way uh, they can pick us up whenever we need it, right? Yeah, well, you know, just just in case just in case anything bad happens, the ambulance is somewhere nearby. But the headline of the Washington Post today was, was really, really peculiar. It, it said Hillary, Hillary Clinton's health just became a real issue in the presidential campaign. Oh, just now? I mean, <laughs> yeah, but... Yeah, but let, let me ask you something. Why is it that that's, – that's today's headline of the Washington Post. But why is it that w- – w- her health is, her health has been an issue in this right. campaign. But why it has to happen to prove to the media that what we've been saying all along is true for them to report on it? You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's really – no, what it, what it boils down to is this. It was their job to do everything in their power to hide it. And today was the first day that there was nothing they can do. They were they were without any ability to hide it from the public anymore, and so now they had to just throw their hands up and said, "Look, guys, we're just going to have to report that her health is now an issue." Do you know Mike Cernovich? I've heard of him. He's he's becoming really big, a uh, big uh, Twitter guy. He also does. Um, he wrote a book called um, uh, "Gorilla Mindset," and he was one of the first people. That said, listen, guys, we need to get off of the scandals because they're not they're not sticking to her. Well, and there's too much protection from the government. Right. That scandals will never stick to her. Right. And he was the first one to say, let's pivot away from the scandals and let's start focusing on her health. And this was law. I mean, everybody knew that there were questions about her health, but um, it was more like questions and, and there was no. Like there was no hard evidence yet, and so everybody was calling Mike Cernovich the, a conspiracy theorist and all this kind of stuff. And then, lo and behold, uh, he just kept hammering away day after day, week after week. And then, uh, then all of a sudden, the coughing fits started happening. 
and the media was still protecting, still protecting. And then, of course, Mike Cernovich saw blood in the water, so he started really going hard on the Hillary Cell thing. Today, he he came out with a uh, because of what happened at nine eleven. He came out with a video where he is now declining the Pulitzer. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, he's de- he's decl- he said I'm declining the Pulitzer right now uh, because I don't want any fake. Uh, you know, he was he was making fun of the media, uh, but he was also patting himself on the back and rightfully so. All this time he's been uh, listening to the mainstream media call him a conspiracy theorist and somebody that's just trying to to take away from the real issues and all that kind of stuff. When in reality. Um, you know, and even I'm going to be honest with you, when he first started pivoting to the Hillary's health, I thought, well, I'll go along with it if it sticks. But I don't really know how real it is. And turns out it's absolutely real. So um, so I just want to know if if you had heard of him because he he's declining the Pulitzer now, which I think is hilarious. Yeah, well, he, bless his heart. He needs to go ahead and accept it. Somebody needs to nominate him for the, for the Pulitzer. <laughs> right. but look, you know. I really want to start what I'm going to be working on over the next week for, for my, my website and my, my YouTube channel and Donald Trump Media Track. My video production is going to be geared toward the debates, obviously, because I'm really concerned about how this pneumonia diagnosis is going to play into the upcoming debates. I really feel like they're going to try to use this to either – something's going to happen because the doctors came out today and they ordered rest for her, bed rest. Of course. So – how does that fit into the debate narrative? It doesn't. It doesn't. So, you know, this is really, we got to pay attention to this, I think, because the, the first debate could be the key to this election. And I, I just, for the life of me, don't know how the doctors order bed rest and you can actually do a debate. So I'm really concerned about that. Well, I don't know what they're doing. You saw this past week. It wasn't a debate. It was in front of Mount, Mount Lauer. Uh, but you saw, oh, yeah. how, you saw how horrible that went. It was bad. It, it was bad. You're talking about the um, the commander in chief snorum. Right. <laughs> the snorum. Uh, I, it was. A, I don't uh, know if you just coined that phrase, but I haven't heard that. That's hilarious. Yeah, I coined it. That's I coined the phrase. Snorum. I, I, I coined a lot of phrases. <laughs> That's um, a good one. That's a good one. It wasn't interesting until Donald Trump came on. You know, the 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 first. Of course, I have to watch the. I wouldn't have watched, but I, I run several websites that, that I have to. I have to pay attention to these things. And it was almost as if Matt Lauer was trying to usher her, get her through the through the, the, the her part of it. She she was it was a thirty minute deal, but she only spoke for about twenty one minutes, twenty two minutes. And it was just really she was I got the impression that at any time she was gonna fall apart. She was just gonna literally fall her pipes are gonna collapse. Hey, I've got and, Oh, go ahead, go ahead. She got out she made it through the thing without her pipes collapsing. <laughs> the debate that's coming up, really, I don't know how she makes it through the debate with pneumonia. And with, they're without, like three uh, hours. Remember how long some of those debates were with uh, Donald Trump, especially I think the first or second one, it was like four hours or three and a half hours or yeah, something Trump like that. Trump said, we got to cut this down. Right. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, you know, mm-hmm. of course, now Trump's probably going to want to ratchet it up, you know. <laughs> yeah, he might want to say, we need five hours. We want the American <laughs> people – to know about their candidates. I demand a five-hour debate. <laughs> Remember, yeah, I mean, there's just a lot to talk about, guys. You know, there's just so much to cover. And, and we uh, need to go back the way they did boxing back in the early 1900s, where you would do yeah, was, 45 rounds. Right, <laughs> 90 rounds or something like that. <laughs> yeah, said, I remember that, man. That was wild. I, oh, I didn't know I, you were I, that I old. <laughs> I've seen clips of it. Oh, okay, okay. (laughs) Steve, check. Right, right. Steve, check this out. During that snorum, did you you see the part when that that veteran stood up and read read that piece at her? Here, let me. I've got the sound clip of him reading that. It's about a minute long, and then she and it's a montage cut up of her attempts to. To, to come back from that. I want to get your opinion and see what you think of this. As an Eagle flight officer, I held a top secret sensitive compartmentalized information uh, clearance, and that provided me access to materials and information highly sensitive to our war fighting capabilities. Okay. While he's reading this off, she is uh, deer in the headlights. I got no idea what the hell you're saying. <laughs> 
Had I communicated this information not following prescribed protocols, I would have been prosecuted and imprisoned. Secretary Clinton, how can you expect those such as myself, who were and are entrusted with America's most sensitive information, to have any confidence in your leadership as president when you clearly corrupted our national security? You know and I know classified material is designated. It is marked. There is a header so that there is no dispute at all that what is being communicated to or from someone who has that access is marked classified. And what we have here is the use of an unclassified system by hundreds of people in our government to send information that was not marked. There were no headers. There was no statement, top secret, secret, or confidential. I communicated about classified material on a wholly separate system. I did uh, exactly what I should have done, and I take it very seriously. Always have, always will. Man, I tell you what, that, that's an Academy Award winning lie right there. <laughs> <laughs> that was method acting. Was method acting. She came up, she invented a new lie, by the way, right there. Yeah, that that was, uh, even the liberal media was shocked to hear that she was communicating on uh, a whole different system the cla- like that was like new information and they it gave the liberal media a whole new uh thing to try to cover up and they were just getting really frustrated with it but you remember she came out and said at one point in time she was she said she, she was confused she didn't know that she meant confidential or classified she thought that it was a, a bracket paragraph c but then whenever whenever that veteran mentioned that she all of a sudden was an expert at classified information and what it looked like in the mm-hmm. markings. I found that to be just mind boggling because remember she feigned ignorance at mm-hmm. one point in time over the classified marking. Right. Uh, they they actually tricked her. Even the uh, the FBI when they uh, interviewed her uh, tricked her into divulging that she knows how it works and what it all means, and then for her to come back later. To say uh, to like like you said, uh, feigning I- ignorance uh, wasn't going to fly, and and for Comey, I just blows my mind. So Comey came out with a way to to get her off by saying, "Well, she didn't intend to do it," which is a total lie anyway. But um, what, <laughs> one thing that she points out in there, and I'm not going to take credit for explaining this. Rush Limbaugh actually did a great job of explaining why this is all a bunch of BS. She said um, all this information that was being propagated about was not marked classified. But here's why um, it's very important to know that it doesn't actually have to be marked classified for it to be treated classified. Um, Rush Limbaugh pointed out that what if you went to a classified briefing? And uh, I can't remember the exact example he used, but I'll make up my own example. Let's say that in this classified briefing, the uh, general said, uh, we're going to invade uh, Saudi Arabia. And you're in this classified briefing and uh, you heard this, right? So then you go and you get on the horn after the meeting's over and uh, or maybe on your computer and you type out an email saying, hey, Guys, uh, brace yourselves uh, over there in Saudi Arabia, or if you're over in Saudi Arabia, whatever. And you're you're actually putting out classified information in an email, not marked classified or anything like that. It doesn't. You, you can't come back later and say, "Yeah, I forwarded that email. Yeah, I sent that email on an unclassified server." But clearly, it's not marked classified. But it, but the the point is, is that you should know it's classified. Because you got that information from a classified briefing. Yes. Oh. Yeah. It, it's mind-boggling. I mean, it, and that's a, that's a good point. But you know, isn't everything that the Secretary of State would do? Shouldn't all of that be confidential? I mean, she should know better. Well, if I mean, she's she talking should, about she... yoga classes or weddings or funerals. I guess not. But yeah. Yeah, the yoga's not working for her, guys. It's just not working. She's <laughs> collapsing. She's falling all over the place. She's head over heels every time we turn around. Maybe you know, she was. Should... Maybe that was her yoga. Oh, I got it's a cons- not working. Ah, uh, here's a conspiracy theory for you. Okay, you said that this whole pneumonia thing is going to be a way for her to try to weasel out of doing the uh, debates with Donald Trump. 
if it was that yeah. important for her to get out of the debates and for her to use a medical condition to get out of it, wouldn't it be slick for her to have faked everything she did this morning? It, it would, but I mean, when you go back and look at those clips, man, it just, it just, it looks like she was, she was just wobbling with it. You know, it, it, that's a hard thing to fake, the wobbles like that. And I, I'm not necessarily saying that she's going to use this to get out of the debate, the debate altogether, but I believe they're going to use this in some kind of way to uh, to to put her in a in a false light for these debates, maybe make her look like the victim, uh, or try to get out of them altogether. I don't know, but we can't ignore this because the debates are just a few days away. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's coming up quick. September 26th. She's got a major it's like pneumonia. A week. Yeah, she's got a major pneumonia complication with a presidential debate coming up. Oh, here's here's how it works out. Here's how it works out, Steve. I, we got this covered. She's going to be there at the, the debate. Do you remember that, that movie back in the 80s, Weekend at Bernie's? Yeah, I remember it. Okay, that's what they're going to do for her. They're going to drag her body out. So they're going to have people to, at her side. There'll be one at either side. One will be doing the arms. The other one will be doing the lips. And oh. Moving the jaw. Oh. Somebody said that I think it, she, Somebody said that when she she was leaning on a concrete column. I don't know if you saw that. If you looked at the video, she was leaning up against a concrete column. And you had to notice that because it wasn't really that obvious. Uh, but they had her leaned up against and And when they pulled her off that column... They said she looked like a puppet whose strings were just cut, just collapsed. And uh, that, that pretty yeah. much uh, sums it up right there. Yeah, I mean, the, the Grim Reaper's somewhere waiting on her. You know, it's, it's really sad. It's, it's a sad thing because she's just not, she's not mentally fit. She's not physically fit. You know, she needs some. She needs some good old Southern hospitality. She needs hospitality. Hospice. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> okay, then, let's take it to the next step then. Um, what happens if she either drops out or, God forbid, actually croaks or something like that? But um, I don't want to see that or anything like that, especially considering that I think that Trump uh, has the easiest road against her directly. But if what if it comes to be that um, either the public forces her out uh, by saying, oh, my gosh, you know, you're way too unhealthy for this. You know, you should rest and drop out. And, I mean, who do they replace her with? And what happens at that point? And what if it happened before the debates? And let's say Cain comes in and he becomes the presidential nominee, maybe. I don't know. Uh, what happens? Have you ever thought about this? Yeah. And Tim Cain is, Tim Cain is just, he's like your worst nightmare. Uh, he really is. If you just look at the guy, he, he just looks evil, and uh, he's got a. He, I can't imagine Tim Kaine as president. I, I, I can't imagine. He doesn't that. seem like a president. I mean, that's, that's, no, and he no, that's, that's, he barely seems like a VP at that. I mean, he's just. I mean, there's people out there that you you let watch your kids and stuff, but he's not one of. He them. He ain't one of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't let Tim Kaine don't don't let Tim Kaine. Uh, watch your kids, but but uh, it's really I don't know Joe Biden perhaps. I was perhaps thinking that too. Biden. I was thinking what, Joe Biden. I mean, because you know what perhaps what Obama Joe. what Obama can do is just executive order Uncle Joe. No, you know what Brian was saying earlier, and uh, oh, yeah, this, this is this conspiratorial. Is, yeah, this is kind of scary. Yeah, Obama could uh, abolish the presidency, and he becomes chancellor for life, or something like that. Yeah, but you, they can't keep using conspiracy theory and, and to cover up her health. I mean, that, that's just that's just. I mean, you, if you go back and look at what Sanjay Gupta, Gupta said a little while ago, it's 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 just not going to work. At some point in time, this thing is just it's wide open now. It's it's wide open. It, it, I'm telling you, I'm watching for these debates because I don't know what they're up to, but they, they're up to something. We well, just got to figure out what this idea that the NFL uh, football games were going to help her out by by uh, taking away from the audience now is not going to work. Everybody's going to be riveted to see if she's going to collapse or not. Well, yeah, it's 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 you know I'm gonna have I'm gonna have plenty of popcorn. <laughs> I'm <gonna be> ready. <laughs> hey, it's 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 like back back during the late '80s, early '90s. Even if you weren't a fan of of boxing. 
you became a fan of boxing because of Mike Tyson. And you would plug in, tune in to see how fast it would drop. I mean, what was the fastest one he dropped? Was I it 90 it seconds? 89 seconds, I think, was one. So so the pantsuit just <laughs> might make her drop, you know, because it's cutting off the circulation to her head. Either that, but they, they, they said it was hot. They, remember, they, oh. they said they, they had to get her out of there because it was it was heat. heat. Today, they, they referenced heat. Who said that? Uh, it was in the news. Yeah, they did. They, I they, did see that, too. They referenced heat they that made it was too hot. When this first happened, they made a reference to the heat. And, you know, then they come back this evening and, and, made, and diagnosed her with pneumonia. But they made a reference to the heat. And, you know, at this point, we just don't know. We don't believe anything coming from Team Clinton. But they make these materials now, these clothing. They make clothing that they could put on her that would keep her nice and cool. I don't know if they've if the technology's caught up with the pantsuit or not. Right. But there is some kind of polyester that she could wear that would keep her nice and cool. But if she can't, it wasn't even that hot today. Right. It was, it, it, it was 70 degrees. One of our loyal listeners, and and I certainly a, a huge fan and follower of, of yours that helped you set up the uh, – the GoFundMe account, Andrea, she's saying it was only 70 degrees at ground zero. Wow, that's different one than what and I heard. Hold on. They said it was warm. Uh, okay, and hold on. This this is just, I'm going to play just a few seconds of this, this clip. This is from Fox News reporting on uh, at the scene of the crime, at the scene of when it went down. And this is what Fox News said. And, John, before we get to that, I wanted to bring our viewers up to date on a story that is breaking right now. Uh, that I just learned about within the last 15 or 20 minutes. As you know, there are many dignitaries gathered at the scene, including uh, Republican nominee Donald Trump and the uh, Democratic nominee Hillary Clinton, who was at Ground Zero, was there for the ceremony, and left, unexpectedly left early because of what appeared to be a medical episode. I have a law enforcement source who was there, who was 15 feet away from Hillary Clinton. He says she was standing on a curb with a protective detail, waiting for her motorcade, uh, they were surprised to see her because she wasn't supposed to be leaving yet, so they had to wait for the motorcade two or three minutes. When it finally rolled up, my source says she stumbled off the curb, appeared to faint, lost one of her shoes that wound up underneath the van. Uh, her protective detail, I'm told, helped her into that van, and then the van took off, presumably in the direction of a hospital. They grabbed her shoe and flagged down her the rest of her detail. Her shoe was given to that detail who, who was following the other two vehicles, and they left uh, ground zero early. Uh, just moments ago because of some apparent medical episode that Hillary Clinton was suffering. It's not terribly hot today, John. Uh, it was warm, certainly warm and warm at the scene. Uh, but again, Hillary Clinton, my source, heard, was 15 warm. feet away, says she appeared to be having some sort of medical episode, uh, had to be helped into her van and left, the, uh, left ground zero early before this ceremony ended, uh, apparently because of uh, a medical problem. Yeah, so he said warm. That's where I heard that they said warm. He said not hot, but warm. Um, I'm I'm surprised. We're talking early morning here, like eight thirty. That's pretty early. See, Andrea swears it was seventy. Even that's yeah. It, I mean, it I mean, was sixty-five degrees if you can't take the heat, stop running for president. There you <laughs> go. You could imagine. You could imagine her her having to go overseas. I mean. This is going to be a, a serious problem. The Middle East is 120 right? degrees at night. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how is she going to hang out with ISIS and help them out with that kind of heat out there? Yeah, if she wants to continue the Obama administration policy, she's definitely going to be over there a lot helping them. I don't know, but this idea that it, it kept saying that she lost a shoe, she lost a shoe. I mean, there's a, there's a Cinderella joke in there somewhere. I, just, uh, I, have, yeah. I know, I've... <laughs> I've been trying to dig one up. I literally dig one up, but um, what, what's... I figured it out yet. There's a Cinderella analogy in there somewhere. We just got to figure out how to do it later. And it's know? it's trending. It is trending on Twitter. Hashtag Hillary's shoe. Really? It it was trending <laughs> this afternoon when I was doing show prep. Oh, it was trending. That's hilarious. Oh my gosh! I mean, if the shoe fits, guys. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, we're going to have to figure it out. Yeah, like mentally walk through the scenario where you're, you're limp, your whole body's limp, you're being drugged into the car, and you don't even have the wherewithal to hold your shoes onto your feet with your toes. You know how, like, imagine if you're wearing, like, slippers or something, 
and and you just let your shoe fall off. And if you were to you uh, clearly she wouldn't have felt it fall off because if she did, I'm sure she would have said, wait, 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 somebody get my shoe. But instead, she her lifeless corpse laid in this van <laughs> with, with one shoe missing, didn't even say a word about it, and they had to have somebody chase the motorcade down holding the shoe up in the air. Oh, yeah, I mean, hibbity-bobbity-boo. I'm, tell, I'm telling you, there, there, there's a Cinderella reference in was there it, Was it almost yeah. midnight yet? I mean, it's going to turn into a pumpkin. <laughs> she, oh, dude, she, a, she, she looked like a pumpkin. Well, I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you guys. I'm gonna tell you guys. I can't stress this enough. Something's up with this. The timing is the timing is off with this. I mean, it's just what are the odds that a, a major president, a candidate for president, just a few days before a huge debate, gets pneumonia? Uh, it's just. I don't well, know. A lot of these one, thi- one of the Right. A lot of these things that happen to her and around her are almost so coincidental it has to be timed a lot of these we talked about now we talked about it a few different times where this happened this happened and that happened three things in a row happened and then the weekend came and then it's gone and we're like what yeah it just disappeared how is that not somehow and i'm not trying to blow conspiracy theories out, out there and say you know oh they're all out to get you but if you are a DNC guy walking through D.C. going to the FBI, watch your back. You might get a bullet. Well, neither of you guys have mentioned this yet, so maybe I'm breaking this to you guys. But did you know that when she – later on that morning, she came out of her hotel with nobody near her, nobody assisting her. She greeted a small child. She had the same clothes on, the same pantsuit with the uh, three-inch thick wool coat, which I have no idea. I don't understand that. Uh uh, and she greeted a small child and then went walking down the sidewalk. And if you look at the look on her face, the smile, she waved. A whole bunch of reporters were screaming, how are you feeling? How are you feeling? And she said, great, great. And they, and as they screamed, what happened this morning? What happened this morning? She ignored them and didn't answer it. And she went walking on. I'm going to tell you right now, clearly based on what I saw, she didn't have pneumonia because if, if she really had pneumonia – she she couldn't have been able to answer that clearly and been that energetic no matter what drugs you're on. I mean, my dad had pneumonia when I was a kid, and he was bedridden for like two weeks straight, and it was kind of scary actually. And and so I, I'm not buying this whole pneumonia thing based on her ability to come back out later on in the day. I, I mean, there's something – I think there's something neurological uh, wrong with her. What do, you, what do you think about that, Steve? Well, it's, it's – it... We're, we've reached a, a point in this in this p- political disc. We've reached a point in political discourse where it's some major achievement that she can fall down and then get back up and convince us that she's okay. I mean, that she's not okay. I mean, she's not okay. It's, it's this idea that she that she can. Are we supposed to be impressed that she's able to come outside and greet a child? I mean, she she had a, a and another thing. They're calling it a medical episode. She right. fell out, man. You know what I'm saying? What was this medical episode crap? Uh, yeah. th- that's just a this way of saying that that she fell out, and and I think that that we're we're going to when she came out in the colostomy covers, uh, that that, that <laughs> thick flex thing. Where, <laughs> when, when she came out with the colostomy, colostomy covers on, it's just like, come on, this is getting ridiculous, right? It's they they said it was because of heat, and then she comes out. They didn't obviously didn't do anything to cool her off, but they they tried to make it seem like it was a marvel that she was able to recover from that. I mean, and I'm I'm just I'm not impressed. I think she needs to to she needs to get the medical help that, that, that she deserves, and she needs to go ahead and drop out of this race, right? And be with her family and be with her family. I mean, she she just needs to give it up. I mean, she she just had a good run and she right off into run. the sunset is what she needs to do. Yeah, she had a good run. And she needs to go ahead and and uh, and, and get the help she needs and, and drop out. Maybe she'll do it this week. Maybe she'll maybe she'll <sighs> yeah. Give that, a confession. That, that begs the question: like, what happens at that point? Who replaces her? What does Obama do? What does Kane and and Biden and all them people do? One thing uh, to to kind of follow. Well, on it's with- easy. I mean. Trump replaces her. I mean, that's easy. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, no, it's interesting Interesting that we're talking about this. Um, as everybody's commenting in the comment sections of all these videos, 
I actually commented, guys, think about it. She was in a good spot to win this thing eight years ago. She would be our current president right now, and she would have the same medical condition that she has right now. As she, but the difference being, she would be our president, and that's kind of scary to think about. Yeah, well, she wouldn't have made re-election. Well, I would have thought that about Obama too. You got to understand how the fix is in. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's- that's the shock heard around the world is is Obama beating Romney four years ago after four years of a miserable presidency. It's just shocking. Well, you've got all those rhino Republicans, and now we clearly see how bad Mitt Romney really, really is. And and even back then, we held our nose and we're like, well, okay, we're going to do this because we got to get rid of Obama. We got to do this. We got to do this, Steve. I know you're all out there in social media, and and social media and technology is is a hundred percent different than it was four years ago, and I feel like we're in another universe than the news, because all yeah. I see is everybody. Like all through Facebook, I'm up. I'm almost up to like three thousand friends, all because of Trump. I mean, Mitt Romney yeah, couldn't have pulled that off. No, no, he could. He Mitt Romney couldn't, and Mitt Romney was in a was in a strong position to win this that, that election. But he just he, was. he failed miserably. But Trump is is such a strong, dominating candidate, and you know Barack Obama was in a lot of senses, a lot of respects, he was the affirmative action candidate for president. Right. And, you know, he, he, right. he used his race. He used his race to win the election twice. But Hillary Clinton, it, it does it, it, affirmative action presidency, presidency it just doesn't work the same for the first female candidate. Um, it's just not the same element that Barack Obama used artfully to win uh, election and re-election. So Hillary Hillary Clinton is just not going to be able to to use that to win. And I just I can't imagine that she's going to defeat Donald Trump. I mean, if I if I had to bet, I would not put my money on Hillary. I just would not do it. Uh, I think a lot of people are with you on that, definitely. Except for uh, who's the silver uh, Nate Silver? He's he said there's only a thirty percent chance that Trump wins. Everybody's just crap. This yeah. guy, he's the biggest never Trumper. And there's zero black votes for Trump. Zero. No, you know, I mean, so, so. It's dumb. It's dumb. Like, you couldn't even say that with a straight face. I know the producer <laughs> handed me this script, and I'm supposed to say, I wouldn't it say it I like say a it. bird and tweet it out like a bird. But, I, you know, Mr. Producer, I honestly cannot pull myself to saying that. Yeah, I mean, so Hillary Clinton's going to get more of the black vote than the first African American president got. Uh, that's, 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 uh, that's ridiculous. I mean, well, that's you know, when I went, um, I, I, I went canvassing door to door this weekend, and we had like eight people show up to canvass with us in this one little neighborhood, and one of them was was black, and I didn't get that in, when we canvassed for Romney. No. So I mean, and I and, never got the the crowds that show up for Trump that we have oh seen. My gosh, yeah. Young young kids. Um, you know, earlier in the show we had a, a, our guest on. Uh, Isbell Scott Isbell, who's a a performer and an artist and a singer. He's twenty two. Twenty two signed on with the Wu Tang Clan. Uh, pop culture, that's what he lives in. He's all in for Trump. Just that 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 age that uh, was wooed by Obama back in the day is certainly not there. Not at all. Right. So I, I just. No. Obama's a non-entity now. He, he really is. He's not. Uh, Obama is just. You're going to find. I think we're all going to going to going to find that Obama is just not going to be able to influence people to vote for Hillary Clinton. Um, it's just. I don't. I don't see it. I don't think that. It's just. It's. It's hard to get somebody motivated to vote for for a rusty old dustbag like that. I, I can't imagine. <laughs> Yeah, and the ones the ones that are all in for it, and when you hear their interviews, you're like, "Gosh, these people are weird." They have to be. How do you get excited about Hillary Clinton? Right. 
I mean, just think about it. You have to get people energized and excited about Hillary Clinton. How does that happen? I don't know. I, I don't know. If your team, if your team Hillary, you got to figure that out, and that's a major hurdle. Well, I mean, they they, pull, a, they pulled out Bill Clinton, and he's screwing it up for him. Like every time he talks, he screws it up. Obama came out and trying to raise money for him. He's screwing it up. Hillary's falling <laughs> flat on her face. She's screwing it up. Did they can't? She, she can't catch a break to save her life, if you will. Well, she needs something to save her life because she's going down fast, man. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow! <laughs> the thriller she in Manila. <laughs> no, she needs something. She's 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 going down fast. I mean, just just to recap, she's falling in the poles. She's falling on the sidewalks. I mean, she, everywhere she goes, she's just falling out. She's uh, falling down faster than a White House intern. Oh, no. Yeah, faster than Bill Clinton's pants at, a, at an intern rally. You know? <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> I so opened up the can of worms. We are listening to Steve Spell too. Um, so how? So Louisiana is a pretty red state. So you don't get? Do you get a lot of? You don't get rallies down there, do you? Don't get what? Rallies? Do you get political? He said that were what? <laughs> Have you ever heard of a political rally? <laughs> Yeah, well, we had Trump had a couple of rallies. I've heard of Trump rallies. We've had oh, okay. two Trump rallies here. Okay, that's and good. I went to both of them. Me and Hannah went, my daughter. We went to both Trump rallies here, and both of them were just huge events. And the energy there was just was just incredible. When when Trump when Trump came to the Baton Rouge River Center, uh, he broke Elton John's attendance record. Oh, guys, no it was, way! It, yeah, that's amazing. It was a major thing. We had twelve thousand, over twelve thousand people in the auditorium, and five thousand people outside that couldn't get in. Wow! It broke out, broke out in John's attendance record, and so you know, there's just Louisiana's overwhelmingly for Trump, and you know, we, Trump's got Louisiana. We, we got Trump's back right. here. Right, and that, that's tech, that's always been pretty much a red state, pretty reliable. That's why I was wondering if you even got any rallies down there because. My now Brian's wife is from L.A. and she was amazed when she came here to Cincinnati because Ohio is a big battleground state. So we're going to get both sides here almost on a daily basis with uh, some sort of um, somebody coming down from the from the campaign from high up almost on a daily basis, definitely on a weekly basis. And she was amazed that they that she could actually go and see him at a rally cuz let me tell you something about California they don't really go there or at least not who really. doesn't go there uh, oh, the, the political candidates right and what? i know trump went to uh, uh uh san jose and they had the riot there and all that kind of stuff but trump's kind of an anomaly when it comes to that historically they wouldn't have rallies in california at well, all because the last one to win california was uh reagan yeah, because it's such a reliably, reliably blue state that even the Republicans are like, you know what, we're not even going to try there, so they don't even go for it. But, but, uh, and I know that Louisiana has been pretty reliably red, and now uh, Ohio is just nonstop battleground, so we get it a lot up here. Yeah, Louisiana is always red in, pre in presidential contests. Right. President, uh, when we run senators, not so much governors, not so much, but presidential contest is always Louisiana historically goes for the republic. That's so, good. so speaking of and, speaking of rallies, the comparison Lou Dobbs earlier this week before Hillary's fallout, Lou Dobbs compared the rallies of uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton last month. Last month, Trump held thirty-seven rallies in one month. Clinton. Thirteen. I mean, that's, I'm actually surprised. That's, I mean, that's a serious regimen, guys. I mean, Trump's Trump's doing two a day, and, and Hillary's is is doing thirteen in a, in, a, in a month. You said, yeah, thir thirteen. Yeah, it's and half of them, she, half of them, she coughed up a lung and had to walk away from halfway through. There was a bunch of yeah, them she, she had to, uh, cancel. I mean, Hillary. She gives a whole new meaning to the term liberal hack, guys. She really does. <laughs> uh. <laughs> That's true. Oh, yeah. All right, Steve. So, oh, go ahead, Steve. Go ahead. No, no, I'm listening. What you, what you say? Oh, no, I was just going to announce, uh, we have Steve Spell 2 on with us on Smith Smith Radio, and uh, we've, been, we've had him on for the whole second hour. Um, we just love having you on, Steve. Uh, let everybody know where they can find you around the social media world. Donald Trump Media Tracker on Facebook. 
Steve Spell 2 on Twitter, and I also have a Steve Spell 2 fan page on Facebook, and then on YouTube it's Steve Spell 2. Okay, and now the 2 is 1-1, one, one, or is it the number 2? Uh, on YouTube it's Steve Spell number 2, and on Facebook and Twitter it's 1-1. One, one. But, you know, or I... I Oh, but your actual I'm, I'm, handle, your Twitter handle is Steve Spell the number two. It's at S T V uh, S P E L L two. That's your actual uh, Twitter uh, handle. So make sure you guys follow him there. Same thing with YouTube, and now I'm not hard to find on the internet. I mean, you, you Google search my name, right. I come. You got I some great right stuff up. on uh, on. I'm following you on on YouTube, and you you always come out with nice little short videos that are really awesome. Pro Trump all the time, and. Sometimes you have your daughter on there contributing, and I think that's awesome. And certainly, folks, you can yeah. always go to Smith Radio, and we've got Steve Spell on there all the time. I usually post something of you, for you, by you. I just, mm -hmm. dude, you crack me up with some of this stuff. Matter of fact, <laughs> <laughs> one of the latest things that you just put out, I think it's it's most recent that you just put out, you and your daughter in the car, and you, you're giving Democrats advice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm gonna, laughs> I'm gonna we're gonna we're gonna in this part of the segment, but I'm gonna I'm gonna fade it out with playing that playing that that clip that you put up on on Facebook. Okay. <laughs> okay, man. Steve, certainly do not be a stranger. We love having you on. This is second second show in a row we've had you on. It's been a blast. I, I mean, my sides are hurting. I've been laughing so hard. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. It was All right, good guys. talking to you, I appreciate Steve. Y'all having me. Yeah, good talking All to right. you. Hey, thanks a bunch. Okay, bye bye. Hey everybody, it's Steve and Hannah here. Hello. Just want to say hi and I want to say thank you for the donations that you've given to the GoFundMe page. Anybody that wants to donate to the Spell family can do so by visiting the link in the description of this video. The money's being put to good use as we try to repair and recover from our losses from the Louisiana flood. I can finally get a book sack now, so thank you guys. Yes, I'm going to buy Hannah a book sack. She's still out of school, but they're telling us September the 12th. Louisiana is real bad. And uh, we haven't seen Hillary Clinton here. Hillary you, who? Hillary Clinton, exactly. We have Hillary who? We haven't seen Hillary who here. Uh, she's a ghost. But while I was here doing this, I, I, I stumbled upon several things that I would like to share with Robbie Mook so that they could possibly learn from our disaster losses here in Louisiana. Here's what I found for Robbie. Oh, there it is. I, I don't normally give advice to Democrats, but Robbie Mook, if you're listening, pay attention. You guys need one of these trucks now for the big debate that's coming up September 26th between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Check this out, Robbie Mook. There it is, folks. Hillary Clinton's debate prep team. Disaster recovery. September 26th, big debate between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton will be a disaster. Therefore, I'm calling on Robbie Mook to call 1-800-SERV-PRO because they're ready for whatever happens. <laughs> Robbie Mook, get one of these trucks and have it somewhere nearby. <laughs> he actually showed a picture of the of the uh the serve the truck. pro it yeah. was like a it wasn't like like around where i live sometimes you'll see a serve pro truck and it's like a little ford ranger this was because he's in louisiana and there's major major disaster there these serve pro trucks were like 18 wheel like even bigger than that they're giant huge uh serve pro trucks i guess for these major di disasters and stuff like that so he showed a picture of that and uh, recommended that Robbie Moo call them up for what is going to be a disaster on the first debate. Hilarious stuff. <laughs> Hilarious stuff. <laughs> Definitely follow follow Steve Spell, too, on YouTube so you can see his videos. He posts them up right away, and um, that's, that's where I get to see him. He's extremely active. And definitely, please, um, find his GoFundMe and uh, donate there because yeah, he GoFundMe. did actually lost a, like I don't he didn't lose the whole house, but the entire first floor he had to gut everything out and replace it. So that you know, they don't have uh, flood insurance because of the area that he's in and all that kind of stuff. So nobody can really get flood insurance. So uh, not not only him but like all of his neighbors, they all had their. Homes destroyed and everything in them destroyed. So make sure you try to uh, uh, donate to that, even if it's just a couple bucks, because it all adds up. It's GoFundMe.com backslash Steve Spell 2. Okay. And that uh, Andrea, one of our uh, – my one of my favorite uh, chat 
uh, buddies, buddies, if you yeah, will, on, on on Spreaker. I love it. She set it up for him. Uh, just phenomenal. Thank you so much, Andrea. I just, I mean, it was. Uh, She's really nice. She, I think she goes on uh, your voice, too, when I'm on and tells everybody, listen to us on Smith Radio. So that's that's really nice. Well, sweet. <laughs> so listen to Andrea on uh, your voice radio. No, she doesn't. She doesn't. She, <laughs> oh, she she's does in the, the chat. She's, she's in the chat. chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she's in the, the chat room. She's the awesome chatter. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, she told everybody in the chat room to come join us over here at Smith Radio. So that's awesome. Okay, so there's uh, we got an hour left. There's just a few few more things to wrap up and talk about. We got the hard news. We got we to with, yeah, yeah. Let's hit it. So we have uh, we went over the attack on 9/11 uh, 15 years ago. Hillary Health and the emails. Did we talk about our emails? Uh, no, not not yet. I mean, we we touched on a little bit, but there is definitely a uh, more. I've got a couple sound bites on the emails. Uh, Oliver North weighs in. Judge Napolitano weighs in, and I got some breaking news on colon. We better get on that if you have sound bites. The colon, the colon, pa- pal. colon, pal. Oh my gosh, that's a debacle! Did you hear about this? Yeah, I did. I did. Okay, folks. Okay, let me let me just rewind back it up a little bit, and you probably already know. Hillary Clinton started to blame her email debacle on Colin Powell right, and right. said he showed me how to, he set me up. He told me to do it. Blah blah blah. And Colin Bow came out and said, "Hey, don't drag me into your dirty laundry, your mud." Well, the distinction is, he, he she tried to say, "Look, I'm not the first Secretary of State to do this." Right. Not only did Colin Powell do it, but he showed me uh, how to do it, and that's what I'm doing. And why should I be in so much trouble when nobody else was? So let me let me back it up a second. She used the word email, private email. Okay. Right. That's what Colin Powell was suggesting to her to use for her private emails. On AOL. Use, yeah. Because, that, well, not necessarily AOL, but Colin Powell used AOL for, for personal his, right. email, not the government because it was too messed up. If I said the word private, what I meant was personal because, yeah, what I mean by that is not classified. Okay, so here's the difference. He did not... Go buy a server and jam it in her bathroom. Multiple to, ser- multiple servers to not only load up with classified uh, information, but also to use it for the whole reason why she got the server in the first place, and that is to hide the actual work she's doing, which would be considered, if not illegal, definitely completely unethical. Which was to use the Clinton Crime Family Foundation to sell access and influence to world leaders okay that's how colin powell laid it out for us all emails found through the wikileaks shows the day after she was put in as secretary of state there's emails showing colin powell emailed her and showed her how to set up and circumvent the law this is how you get around the government seeing your stuff colin powell is guilty he is guilty as hell really he, he showed her how, he's like yeah you, you want to do this this is how you get around it man because you don't want them seeing your stuff so he's just as bad as her then yes okay so what what do we the, by the way this is breaking to me i didn't know that it's, it just went down just a couple days ago okay I mean, it's, you know so does that get her off the hook no, I think it's more damning because she's more cognitive. It shows that she is cognitive of the illegal act. Oh, so it shows intent. It does. So literally, we now he have said, intent. now listen, Mrs. Clinton, what I'm about to tell you to suggest that you do is highly illegal. So go forward at your own peril. And she did. Is that what you're telling me? Yes. Oh, wow. So it's worse. My first thought was, well, doesn't it, if everybody's breaking the law over there. But no, it sounds like that is huge. So um, did, you don't have it listed here, but uh, Julian Assange had an uh, interview with Sean Hannity. And, I don't have that. Okay, but I'll, I'll just go over briefly. Basically, he has loads of information coming out that's going to sink Hillary Clinton as if she's not already. I mean, sunk. hashtag... 
sinking uh, Hillary sinking or sinking Hillary is trending. One of the two. Something, yeah. Well, it's because Julian Assange of what he's the uh, senior editor at <laughs> WikiLeaks. And by the way, I didn't know this, but he got his start as a teenager hacking into U.S. government servers. So that's why he doesn't live in America. Well, he, he's—I he, don't think he ever did. Well, you, you wouldn't want to come back to America, right? Well, obviously, he would be considered uh, a fugitive of America, I guess, uh, since they'd be after him for doing this. But so he's been doing this, and of course, everybody considered him a bad guy until you know he he uh, kind of uh, kind of became a savior of of freedom, if you will, by. Preventing a tyrannical government in the United States from taking liberty and freedom away from its citizens. So, so that's why why Sean Hannity has now kind of flipped the script and and decided he kind of likes Julian Assange and thinks that he's actually been a benefit to America for that reason. When Julian states it very clearly, I we are WikiLeaks is funded by the people. We don't take money from governments or politicians. We're funded by the people. And he has a 501c3 nonprofit organization in America. How is that not that shut you down can now? donate to if you if will? If they don't like him and they want to get rid of him, the first thing they that would I do don't is know. shut down his organization. I mean, the IRS would be all over that, like, uh, uh, yeah, I guess uh, White on Rice or something. I don't yeah. know. Uh, so, um, so that's what he's doing. And now he doesn't, he was asked how he gets this information now. And he said, oh, I, I'm not in the hacking business anymore. I don't hack. He gets this information from other hackers who want to get their stuff out there. And where do they go? They go to Julian Assange to get it published in WikiLeaks. Okay, okay, check this out. I'm a hacker. You are? No, I mean, imagine oh, if I'm a okay, hacker. Okay, okay. I'm a hacker. And I'm like, I know a lot of other hackers because that's 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 my game. It's like a community, oh, right? Oh, okay. you know. <laughs> Come on, man. Right, right, you right. Know. Like poker players, they know the other poker players. And right. Like personally. They know personally. Okay. Yes. Okay. But none of them are getting paid. And Julian says, hey, how do I make this legit to get paid? Okay, boys, here's what I'm going to do. I'll put together this organization. Nonprofit. I'm going to go legit. <laughs> you all feed me the info and I'll help maintain you financially. And all he has to do is say, it's anonymous. It's the sources are anonymous. I don't divulge my sources. Right. 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 So check out what happened. The WikiLeaks and, and the initial dump that got uh, the DNC in trouble gave hackers the, uh, motivation and uh, they were so excited about how successful the dnc leaks were that they went on a rampage to try to get more information and that's what this next dump is all about it's additional information that people went and got motivated motivated by the success of the dnc leaks right and the reason he hasn't dumped it yet is because they're processing it. He said that when you get this raw information, when he puts it on his servers for consumption, there's work involved. It's not a one for one. It's not like you upload it and you're done. He has made all of Hillary Clinton's emails searchable yeah. by search words. Right, right. So, so as he processes this, it takes some time. And once it's done, then he can present it through WikiLeaks for people to search. Right. That's why it's taking time. It's not. There's a lot of people out there. They're like, "Ooh, in order to help Trump the best, he's going to wait till the optimum time." It's not that. It's not unlike that. Uh, unlike James Comey with the FBI. <laughs> uh, it is a weekend holiday. It's a four day weekend for some people. So let's, let's dump, dump it on, on Friday or Thursday, really late at night. If it's a, if they're going to take Friday yeah, off, right? Right. Yeah, one of those days. So, no, in his case, they're just going to make sure it's all um, properly uploaded and, and formatted for his website so that people can view it properly. So that's what he's going to do. And he couldn't really say much about the content other than it's explosive, it's going to sink her campaign. And every time he asked 
uh, Sean asked him about, well, what about this? What about this? Can you give me details about this? He kept on responding with, well, I don't want to scoop myself. So he knows what's on it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He knows – He knows. All, well, you know, it's hard to read 30,000 or whatever he's – or I think he said 100,000. He said tens what? of – He said tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands wow. of uh, information. So do you think the public can scour through that before the presidency? I'm sure he's hoping to get it out as soon as possible because he knows it's going to take a while to digest this stuff. But – if it's searchable, you can expedite. You're not going to have to do it by brute force. You're not going to have to just say, well, starting on page one of 100,000, let's start reading. It's not going to be like that. You're going to be able to search it. And um, one thing about Julian Assange that you need to realize, which is uh, very promising, is that he always underpromises and overperforms. So when he says it's going to sink Hillary, I'm pretty much sure that – it's going to just obliterate her. Uh, yes. I mean, uh, he has not. Sean. This- Sean says he's always been right about everything that he said. When he comes out with an outrageous charge, he's saying it based on information that he got. And every time in hindsight, he's right. That's why Sean was intrigued by him. Sean wanted to do. He spent like it was his three. He has a three hour show that comes on on radio at uh, 3 o'clock Eastern time, right? He spent, I think, two and a half hours interviewing him. Like, no way! Yes! I've never heard him interview anybody he that said, long. He said, we got our hard break coming up at the top of the hour. You've been very generous with your... I'm actually quoting him verbatim. You've been so generous with your time. Is it possible you could stay over uh, after the next break? And Julian was like, oh, absolutely, sure. He stayed over for like two hard breaks at the tops of both hours. He was like two and a half hours into this thing. Yikes. Yeah, so he got – and you know I was riveted. I was absolutely riveted. So so I'm really glad that he did that. And here's the, the question I was screaming through the radio for Sean to ask is – why is everything being dumped on Clinton and nothing being dumped on Trump? Because it appears as though you're just a Trump supporter. He's already answered that question in another interview. Well, he did finally. Oh, get he did. To okay. It. He finally okay. got to it. It was like towards the. It was like halfway through the third hour. He said, "Trump is an open book, so there's no secrets about him." Right. Right. And he said, he said in a different interview, he said, there's nothing that I could tell you about Trump that, that will you shock want, you. Yeah. It's there's our, nothing I can give knows. you about sh- Trump he, that will sink him, that will shock you. you, you it's already out it's there. It's already out there. He said, if somebody asks Trump a question, he answers it, and you're going to get the whole story from him. Isn't He that, doesn't necessarily even like Trump. Oh, well, that's what everybody – everybody thinks that Russia wants Trump to be president, and they hired Julian Assange to make sure that that happens. Right. <laughs> Right. That's li- that's literally what the left and the establishment Republicans think. Turns out the truth of the matter is is that Julian Assange just wants to get as much secret information out there as possible in order to promote WikiLeaks. That's all he wants to do. And it turns out that the DNC and the Democrats led by uh, Hillary Clinton are chock full of shocking secrets. Yeah, guess who's in bed with them? Our good buddy Sam. Nice to see you back on the chat board, Sam. Mm-hmm. Possibly Glenn Beck. Mark Levin might have something on. And that, that, these names, these Republican names, are going to start showing up in these emails. Oh, yeah. Uh, John Boehner has already showed up in uh, some of the emails uh, as, as receiving payment oh from the gosh. DNC. Really? Yeah, go to Gru- from the DNC? Go to Grucifer 2.0's oh. blog. It is, it's, it's insane. He just did the... Uh, uh, the Nancy Pelosi email dump. He dumped Nancy Pelosi's emails. Uh, Grucifer did 2.0. And, and in those emails, it just showed a lot of moving around with money, names, some names, some Republican names that were involved with it. I'm telling you, these snakes that are that are in Congress, they're all in bed with each other. They, they have. If you're going to be a lifelong congressperson or senator in, in, in D.C., You've got to be, uh, so far, you've got to be dirty. You've got to be on the take. You've got to be on the dole. And that's how they stay in. So you want me to read you a scoop that, that we received from a, a source? 
Okay. I'm going to just have to read it because I don't know. Um, you're, you, please just digest. Indulge me, and, and you're going to have to digest it yourself. So here's uh, what I got. This our, our, uh, I'm just going to read it. Sort. <laughs> I'm just going to read it straight from the message I got. You want to know why the Dallas Police Department chief is retiring? Because he asked the state of Texas. Oh, by the way, this is uh, from, yeah Dallas. Uh, the state of Texas to investigate the mayor of Dallas and two city members on whom uh, and why the Black Lives Matter protest was not permitted and who funded the protest. The governor of Texas told him to retire. And if you don't like it, uh, uh, if you don't like it, but we are not investing them. Inve and I think that he meant to say investigating them. That's the truth. The chief will have a book deal shortly. So we have the scoop on that. More scoops. Mark Cuban is being blackmailed. Well, on Twitter, Mark Cuban has become a joke. Well, he here here's a conservative uh, businessman. He's not political. He doesn't know crap about politics. He he uh, threatened to to run for president, but he doesn't understand ideologies. No, I could tell by listening to him. He doesn't understand politics. He doesn't understand ideologies. He doesn't know the difference between Republicans and Democrats, except for what the low information voters know. Right. Uh, that being said, he initially liked Trump. He was uh, supporting Trump initially, and then suddenly he blasts on Trump every chance he gets. I think he's uh, he's being blackmailed, according to our source. He owes four hundred and sixty million to the state of Texas, and another two hundred million to the city of Dallas. Not including 140 million to the city of Houston for a deal that went south. Yikes! Uh, by the way, uh, Mark Cuban is the owner of the Dallas Mavericks. Mavericks. That's uh, what he. That's the business he went into after he retired from the dot com industry uh, after selling his business for six billion dollars to Yahoo when Yahoo was trading for two hundred and twenty dollars a share. Okay, by the way, what, what business the was company, it? The Yahoo. No, what business did he sell to Yahoo? Oh, it was streaming audio. Nice. Uh, they Well, it wasn't him personally, but him and his little group was were the ones that developed streaming audio for the internet. And he was streaming uh, sports over the internet. By the way, this was back in like 99, you know, back when, back when streaming audio was unheard of. Well, yeah, not only that, but unless you had a connection... You had to have a good connection to to stream anything, yeah. Because let alone download data. a picture, right? So eventually, as te technology caught up, the streaming worked. Yahoo was interested. Yahoo was worth so much money; uh, it's it was unbelievable. They were, like I said, they were selling or they were trading for like two hundred and twenty dollars a share. Same shares now worth like a dollar or something like that. Way to go, Yahoo. Seems yeah. like everything you've touched, you've destroyed. Well, they wasted all their money on Mark Cuban. Ah. So $6 billion. At, that was right before the dot-com burst. When the dot-com bubble burst, Mark Cuban was the one with all the money. Okay, so Cuban sinks Yahoo and Hulk Hogan sinks Gawker. Nice. Okay, all right. Good times, man. So anyway, so the, so he he takes the money and goes and buys the Dallas Mavericks and whatever, turns them around, whatever. So anyway, so he's in he's in Texas. He his business partner is owing the Dallas Morning News. Oh, he owns. Uh, oh, oh, his business partner is the owner of Dallas Morning News. They why they endorse. Oh, they endorse Clinton. That explains it. Uh, the the Democratic state representative threatened to spill the beans about millions owed if he did back. If he didn't back Clinton, I guess. And to add, he owes four different contractors millions that dropped lawsuits three weeks ago. In the Dallas courthouse, the contractors give max contribution to Clinton campaign last month, three hundred thousand to Clinton Foundation, and that is the truth. And let's talk about Glenn Beck. You know, I ran across Glenn Beck, and he was going to be in my stack in of stuff in person. Yeah. Well, I got to at least report when, this. Okay, when I was when I was visiting, doing some. Some charitable work with the prison inmates. I walked past Glenn Beck because uh -huh. he was entering prison. Uh huh. Nah, I'm just joking. <laughs> Glenn Beck should be in. No, yeah, he, he should be in prison. Yeah, for, no, for eventually, for eventually. the crimes of mental gymnastics and <laughs> twisted logic. Oh. You're violating people's minds. Well, I mean, when you. When, when you, you compare a terrorist organization, oh no no no, to it's a peaceful Nazis. or it's not 
every single episode, I got a drinking okay. game. If anybody follows me on Twitter listening right now, you're aware of the drinking game. You're supposed to take a shot every time Glenn Beck or one of his minions compares Trump or Trump followers to Nazis or Hitler. And okay. every morning by about 10 o'clock, I'm drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so drinking your breakfast again. That's, yeah, right. that's why we do a night show. <laughs> so anyway, here's about Glenn Beck. He failed to pay state property tax according to records last year. Oops. All residential, school, and business taxes are unpaid. He has tried to file for an extension claiming some kind of hardship. Okay. Now, why would he have a hardship? Because his business is failing. Yes. And by the way, he uh, last week, he answered to uh, people blasting on him about going out of business, having to close up shop, having to shut all of his stuff down. And they laughed uh, very cautiously. They were like, <laughs> yeah, well, because somebody said he'll be off the air in two weeks. And they said they all all his minions and everything like we guarantee you in two weeks when we're on the air. You guys will be eating crow. Okay, four weeks after this last uh, debacle that he did, he compared Black Lives Matter, sympathized with them. He did. He and did. said they are just like the Tea Party. Oh, my gosh. I call Glenn Beck because, uh, you know, at one point I thought he was doing good work. I felt like he was the unofficial founder of the uh, Tea Party. He's not the official, but the way he embraced them – Built them up, worked with them, and uh, and this was at this was when Glenn was at the very pinnacle of his popularity and success. He said, "The Tea Party is it," and that's right. that because of that, he's largely responsible for uh, how popular they become. And w in 2010, you had this uh, sweeping conservative victories in the elections, and I have to credit the Tea Party. And Glenn Beck's um, building them up as part of the reason why that happened. Here's the problem, though. He's also the person that destroyed them. Correct. When, when the left came out and started calling Tea Party followers and the Tea Party in general a racist organization that uses the N-word, that spit on black people and all that kind of stuff, he was the first to come out and uh, agree with the premise the premise being that that kind of stuff was actually happening. And and uh, Glenn Beck freaked out. All of his followers freaked out. And because of that, I have to blame Glenn Beck and his cowardice for the reason why they fell. And, and what he's doing now is uh, freaking out about every single little thing that comes out about Trump. And in, so what he does, he did – he's trying to do to Trump what he did to the Tea Party. The difference is – Glenn Beck was responsible for the Tea Party. Right. You can he's destroy not, your own – something right. that you've created, you can destroy it. He's he not, did not create this. Not that, Trump. No. no, no. Trump is a movement that, that Glenn Beck has nothing to do with. And when he's trying, he's trying desperately to destroy him just like he did succeed at destroying the Tea Party. And he is failing miserably. And I hope – that he goes down hard for it. I, I hope he goes out of business. I might be right. Maybe four weeks. Maybe maybe more. But according to Sam, 1200 a.m. in San Antonio, Texas, is moving Joe Peggs to Glenn Beck's morning spot. I wish this stuff was happening <laughs> all across the country earlier. I think that there should have been a protest. If you're – okay, let's say I own a radio station and – in that radio station, I fill the whole lineup with conservative talk shows. As That would mean that I'm trying to push a conservative agenda, right? Correct. For that reason, I would have gotten rid of Glenn Beck a long time ago. Yeah, you can't keep that if you want a conservative message. You, you can't keep that knucklehead around. And some of those people like, uh, what is it, Liberty Safe and whatever, whoever it is that is advertising with Glenn Beck, I think – I think that everybody should dedicate themselves to two straight days of listening to Glenn Beck for no other reason than to write down every single advertiser that advertises during his program. And when, and after two days, you should have all of them. Okay. And once you're done doing that, 
call them up, email them, blow them up on Facebook or whatever, and, and say to them, I'm not going to, to buy any of your products. I'm going to boycott you, and I'm going to support um, a uh, campaign against you unless you pull your advertising from Glenn Beck. And you can go to Liberty Safes on Facebook, and you can't complain, and they will respond to you. Good. I did. I, I went to uh, Liberty Safe That's on just Facebook. One. There's a whole bunch of them that but it, he he Glenn blows Beck. that one up a lot. But okay. there's a whole bunch of other ones. And when I when I wrote to Liberty Safe and they wrote back to me, it was about three or four different back and forths. The last bottom line, it was like a copy and paste paragraph mm-hmm. of, well, we support candidates, and there's all kinds of you know controversies and things like that. And blah blah. So it was. He pays it was their them. Way to, it, was, it was their way to get out. Here's the thing about Advertiser. It's a company that is supporting a, um, uh, uh, a, uh, a a talk show host or talk show on the radio by buying advertising space. And that's how they make their money. Right. That's the only way they make their money. That's the only way. So Glenn Beck needs to have his money taken away from him. By telling the people that are paying him, which are the advertisers, to stop advertising with them. Got to. You so, got to. absolutely. So, we can go into uh, – let's let's wrap up this thing with Hillary. I've got um, Judge Napolitano scoured through the FBI dump uh, last Friday a week ago. And the judge had, the judge had this to say on uh, Fox – Judge Knapp, FBI, there we go. Judge had this to say. What we learned on Friday of Labor Day weekend was that the FBI knew about the destruction with a sledgehammer of two Blackberries, that the FBI knew that a server had been wiped clean professionally by a service called BleachBit, which means you cannot resurrect it after BleachBit has been applied to it. And what we learned is that a laptop used by one of Mrs. Clinton's senior aides was put in the U.S. mail and never arrived at the location so to you, which you're it laying out a case of obstruction of justice. That, that, out, that's what you think. I'm laying out two cases. Obstruction of justice by people working for Mrs. Clinton, either directly or contractors that she hired, and the FBI being told to look the other way in the face of this obstruction of justice. All right, stop there. Why would the FBI do that? Because the FBI was restrained in its interrogation of Mrs. Clinton. They never called a grand jury. They never got a subpoena. They never got a search warrant. In the documents that they released on Friday, I counted five statements by the FBI in there saying, we couldn't find this, we couldn't get that. It's their own fault that they couldn't find it because they didn't have available to them the law enforcement tools that they should have because somebody in the White House stopped them. You think that's true? Yes, I do. That's a conspiracy. Wow. Uh, Judge Napolitano lays the case out that Obama is protecting Clinton and then and Clinton is doing everything she can to uh, destroy all the evidence while Obama's protecting. Not only that, but more evidence to this um, is that the uh, the specialist who deleted all these emails. The Justice Department granted him 100% immunity. Well, what else could they get out of him? Out of treasure trove of what he deleted? (laughs) Oh, oh, so they could ask him what he deleted. What he deleted? Did you save anything? Did you move anything? Where did you go with it? Put yourself in his shoes. Who told you to do it? Yeah, okay, that's a good question. Who told you to delete it? How did you delete it? When did you delete I mean, just a litany of things to nail down the timeline of when this stuff was going on. Because because now we're starting to see that they destroyed and deleted things while under subpoena. Oh, wow. That's not good. There's got to be some jail time for something yes! for that. Wow. Look, can I explain to everybody really quick, just on a technical standpoint, how this bleach bit works? It's really simple. Um, a, a server will have these um, hard drives, okay? And just like in your computer, your computer has a hard drive. It doesn't matter if it's solid state, and it doesn't matter if it's uh, the old, the kind that rotate. Basically, what you have is you have these ones and zeros on a uh, disk that are stored on the disk. And these ones and zeros 
are the data that make up whatever files it is that you're saving. And so as you add more and more of these files to your disk, you're just filling it up with these ones and zeros that are in the right order that, that can be read and recreated as the file. So let's say I email Brian and Brian saves that email and I have it saved. It will go on our hard drives as a stream or a string of ones and zeros that will be stored on your hard drive in that way. And your computer will be able to remember exactly where the start and end to those ones and zeros are on your hard drive, okay? When you go and delete a file, and remember the file is just a string of ones and zeros that's in a specific spot on your hard drive, what you're really doing, you're not, you're not changing the ones and zeros on that hard drive. What you're telling the computer is, you don't want to you don't need to find that string anymore and i don't want to see it and it doesn't need to be saved in case you want to uh save something over the top of yeah, it you can rewrite over it and it's no big deal yeah, i the, just don't want to see it right now you you're you don't have to ever again really right. ever again right. you're telling the computer i don't want to have a reference to this string of ones and zeros ever again and in addition to that if you need the space, you can overwrite it. Right. How, what does I, that mean? It's still there. What it means is, well, as long as it hasn't been overwritten. Correct. Correct. Sometimes an email um, that you told to delete, the, the string is still on your hard drive. If it does get overwritten by another file, only a, maybe a little piece of the entire string is overwritten, which means a big chunk of the rest of the email is still there and can be retrieved. Right. Maybe just not all of it. And so, uh, so some of that could be retrieved too. What BleachBit does, this is what BleachBit does. It will go through all of the available ones and zeros on your entire hard drive and reset them. Either to all zeros or all ones. All of them. So all of the files that you told your computer to, quote, delete, which is not really deleting them. All it's doing is telling you you don't need that file anymore is actually going through and changing all the ones and zeros to something else. So literally bleach bit rewrites all that Every, information on the hard drive from beginning right. to end so that it is all not what it was. Yes. Yeah, so there's no string of ones and zeros left on the entire hard drive that mean anything. And Yikes. That, that's why. And it's so simple. There's nothing complicated no. about it. You're just telling the uh, hard drive that you don't want any strings of any ones and zeros anywhere on it. And that's it. Right. So uh, so that that's what that is. I just want to explain that so that people understand how thorough how, – first of all, how, they, how, how the, deleting files doesn't work. Right, and how they a actually used a specific program to destruct – everything right. that they have it's it's just as good if not i would i would argue better than hitting it with a hammer because pieces up on that yeah, yeah those hammer pieces those yeah. forensic scientists yes. they will take a chunk a, a fragment of a disc from a hard drive and read the ones and zeros on those right. fragments and they could piece together it's almost like uh, taking paper out of a shredder and seeing if you can line with them the up to read the the words again yeah the credit card numbers well, forget yeah. the credit. I'm talking whole documents. <laughs> right. Yeah, so so that's possible. Okay, so, and my last sound bit I've got on this, uh, Ollie North has surfaced. Oliver North? He's the I can't recall guy from the 80s. From the 80s. And oh, he, he's the one that invented the phrase, I don't recall. Oh, good guy. Like he's a conservative, him. former colonel. Right. All the above. So, and He's he, a Marine Corps colonel, I think. And here's what he talks about his past compared to Hillary's future. <sighs> Okay. I would point out that I was indicted for altering, removing, and destroying U.S. government classified documents and, and therefore aiding and abetting, the actual charge was aiding and abetting the obstruction of Congress. Now, mercifully, I was exonerated. But at the end of the day, that's exactly what she did. I, I, I simply point out that there is a truly different standard for those of us who serve in the armed forces and most of us who serve in government and the treatment that Mrs. Clinton is being given by the Justice Department. Oh, what about the guy that took pictures inside the submarine? 
He's using the Hillary Clinton defense. He did, and it failed. Failed miserably. Yeah, he's going to spend – I don't know if he's already been sentenced or not. I know he was in the news last week because sentencing was upcoming. But they're saying that there's a very good chance that he'll spend a whole solid year in the military prison. The brig is what they call it. So Trump had a, had a, had a rally this week, and this is what Trump had to say about the fitness <laughs> – or the lack thereof, Hillary, with her emails, the FBI, and her interview with the FBI. And this is Trump hitting back hard. But it just doesn't matter anymore because she's fallen out. In the FBI report, she claimed she couldn't recall important information on 39 separate and different occasions. She can't even remember whether she has trained in the use of classified information. That's true. And she said she didn't know... The letter C means confidential or at least classified. If she can't remember such crucial events and information, honestly, she's totally unfit to be our commander in chief. Totally unfit. This was in front of the military, wasn't it? This is that clapping. But I have a feeling she did remember, and she does know, and that also makes her unfit. They, you know, whenever she, he blasted on Hillary Clinton as her not being a good candidate for president or commander-in-chief, these military people were like standing ovation practically, really cheering big time. I mean, it was it was something. I can't remember the last time. A candidate, or even really, to be honest with you, I can remember the military or a um, the actual president uh, got so warm a welcome of anything that they said when the audience is all military. Right, it was very heartwarming as far as I'm concerned. They're saying right now the new numbers: uh, Trump is plus twenty with the military, and that's this is an unprecedented. It be, yeah, it should be bigger in my opinion, but. Plus 20 is pretty big. Well, one thing about the military is that a vast majority of it, very young people. When I was in the military, I was a low information Democrat. I didn't even know I was a bleeding heart liberal. Somebody accused me of that while I was in the military. Had never heard of it. Never heard of a, a bleeding heart liberal. They had no idea what it meant. And when he accused me of it, my gut reaction was to deny it, and I did. I was like, no, I'm not. I'm not a bleeding heart liberal. Yeah, I just didn't like to be called that right. or a name of any kind. Right. Just didn't feel right. So I, I uh, disagreed with him even though I had no clue what I was talking about. And um, that being said, the military is full of a bunch of young people. So plus 20 is probably uh, about as best as you can hope for. Yeah. No, certainly. Um Real quick, I'm, I'm just going to kind of run through this real fast, this whole thing with uh, uh, just to recap the whole uh, uh, Clinton-Trump interview with uh, Matt Lauer on the presidential. Rat, Rat Lauer, right? Rat Lauer. Yeah, yeah, Rat on the Lauer. presidential forum. Uh, Hillary Clinton says, we did not lose a single American in the Libya-Benghazi action. She might as well have just fell out right there and claimed pneumonia. Right. So that's just out of control. Um uh, Matt Lauer's performance was merely a failure. It was horrifying and shocking. Which, by the way, wrote, isn't it telling? Isn't it telling that the the whole liberal, not just media, Twitter, all the liberals on Twitter everywhere, blew up on how horrible a job Matt Lauer did? Isn't that telling about who won that? Right, Jonathan from uh, New York Magazine wrote that. That was quoting Jonathan from New York Magazine. That uh, uh, Lauer's performance, mere failure. Other articles wrote uh, that the the next person that's going to do the debate on on the 26th, he's going to look at Matt Lauer and he's going to learn not to fail. Other people were right. They were right. (laughs) He will use that as an example on how not to fail. Oh, my God. Uh, By the way, that whole thing with Mexico, Trump going to Mexico and meeting with the president. Huge. Huge performance as a leader. Oh yeah, showed great. showed poise, showed uh, just unbelievable presidential ability to all of America, even more so than Obama. And I was I was like, well, what about Hillary? 
Yeah, she was given an invitation and she declined. Right. That was one of the first things they said when they came out and started speaking was that he invited both of them and uh, we thank Trump for coming. And he was very respectful to Trump, treated him as if he was already president or at the very least that he knew that this was going to be the next president of the United States. Right. And then subsequently was taken out to the woodshed and the president took to Twitter and, and said some crap about Trump. But after he left, said, oh, yeah, by the way, no, no, I know we are not paying for that wall. Okay, yeah, right, Mr. Reporter, to ask Trump, did you talk about the money for the wall is dumb. Well, he didn't need to. No, of course not. Trump could say, um, well, I didn't even need to bring it up to him because uh, he's paying for it whether we talk about it or not. Because he is going to pay for it. Here's the thing, and I said – I don't know if I said – I'm sure I said this on Twitter at least, but I'm not sure if I said this on subsequent uh, or previous episodes, but – Trump does not need to ask permission of anybody in Mexico whether or not they should pay for the wall or not. Of course not. No. If he wants Mexico to pay for the wall, he'll arrange the situation that will result in Mexico paying for the wall. Correct. And that's what's going to happen. It's it's, it's done. It's going to happen. It's done. It's done. It's not that big a deal. It's not that hard. People complaining about the wall. The, oh, I had a conservative come up to me yesterday at the festival. He's got to watch his mouth. What? He's got to watch. You can't say build a wall. Why not? They had a wall in Berlin. Oh, wait a minute. Who said this? Um, Some drunk conservative at the festival. This, somebody said it on uh, 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 YouTube. Oh, so she was pe- repeating. Yes. Somebody said. Somebody came out with a, uh, a YouTube video that said... Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember who it was. Oh, Jesse the Body Ventura. Oh, that scum. That Jesse the bag. Jesse the Body Ventura was in was interviewed, and his his interview is on YouTube. And he said, "What are we building a wall for?" You know, in his crazy yeah. voice. Uh, what is this East Berlin? We had a wall in East, Berlin. and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Do you not understand East Berlin, West Berlin, America, Mexico? You're given the wrong analogy. People were trying to. The wall was built in East Berlin to keep people in. Well, between, between East Berlin and West Berlin. And to keep people in the communist section. Right. This wall is to keep communist people out. Bad people out of America. We don't right. want you all running up it in here. Like, um, it would be like it would be like West Berlin building a wall to prevent East Berliners coming over to um, sabotage, and, uh, yeah, whatever, start r- race well, riots and wars, and or bring heroin over terrorists. like Mexico's doing, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, <gasps> bringing, uh, bringing the gang activities, bringing over uh, the um, immigrants who will come over to do nothing more than to uh, leech off of the government programs, which, right. by the way, they shouldn't be allowed to do. And I'm sure Trump is going to correct that. So. So, yeah, the, the analogy that Jesse the Body Ventura uh, used was the opposite. It's West Berlin, and yes, we knew to a wall. You know, and he, he said, what do you think uh, 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 Ronald Reagan would say about building this wall? He said, tear down this wall uh, with regards to <sighs> communism. Well, here's the thing. We were in a Cold War with not Russia, with the USSR. The USSR no longer exists, so stop trying to fight a new Cold War. What do you think? It just blows my mind. Deanna just uh, messaged as well. Uh, what about Britain and their wall? Britain's building a Trump wall. Are they calling it the Trump <laughs> wall? <laughs> they should. That's they what should. everybody on Twitter's calling it, the Trump wall. Britain's building a Trump wall. That is hilarious. Right. There are other countries that now, are. Wait a minute. Why would they need a wall? They have a moat. Uh, apparently they need a wall somehow. So they need a wall. It's the English Strait or the Strait of England. What is that? The giant body of water that we had to go across just to invade the beaches of Normandy. Right. Oh, people have tried to swim that. Actually, I think it was done. They made it. Somebody got across Woman it. Woman did it once. Somebody got across it with a pedaled, powered airplane. Holy hell. Yeah, look that up. That ain't no fun. Google that. So, did you see what was trending the past couple days? 
basket of deplorables. Oh, what did she do? I couldn't believe how quick that trended. That, that took off on Twitter. Like it was on fire. I, I think Mike Cernovich pointed out that this is her 40. Well, Romney had his 47% moment. Quote, I'm using air quotes 40, here. 47% won't vote for me, so I'm not even looking at him. I don't, yeah, we don't care about the 47% that aren't voting. And you know what? That was devastating to him. Well, the media made it devastating. He was right in what he was saying, but it didn't come off right. Well, here's why he was wrong. Trump is like, listen, I know there's a bunch of you guys that are not going to vote for me. But you know what? When I'm done implementing all of my stuff, everybody's going to do better. You're going to be happy. We're going to make America great again for everybody that lives in America who is a U.S. citizen. Right. So that, that was divisive by uh, uh, Romney saying that. However, the media ran with it, and they also ran with the fact that he killed a man's wife. So then fast forward to Clinton doing the basket of deplorables. What is she talking about? Here's Judge Janine. She opens it up and then lets Hillary run her mouth. I go on vacation. I come back, and I have this open all planned. And last night? Hillary Clinton says this. Okay, this was Thursday night. You could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. (laughs) Right? Is that a good reaction? It was kind of a cautious reaction. (laughs) The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic. Right? The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic. Is that, hold on, hold on. Is that, in, is that in slow motion? Uh, did you slow that video down? I did, I did. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was going to say because it sounds like she's about the to sexist, pass out. Sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. <laughs> and unfortunately, there are people like that. <laughs> and he has lifted them up. Now, some of those folks. They are irredeemable, but thankfully they are not America. Wow, that is rough. Deanna, I am with you. I am deplorable as well. How about you, Carrie? Well, I almost changed our Twitter name to um, uh, Deplorable Radio, and I thought, well, I don't want to ruin our brand. I'm not. Oh. Ru- it wouldn't be ruining it. Just the name. Uh, what I'm saying is, is that people would be like, what happened to Smith Radio? Yeah. But yeah, I almost called us deplorable radio. That would have been pretty funny. But whatever. Um, yes, there was a lot of people on Twitter now who have uh, Change. changed their name to blah, 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 uh, basket of deplorable or, or deplorable blank or deplorable whatever. Deplorable is everywhere. Yeah. So if you are on Twitter and listening right now and you have no idea what all this deplorable is, that is what they're refer- referring to. They're referring to a title that Clinton gave to them that they are now embracing. Like, yes, I'm deplorable, whatever. I don't care. If you didn't like Judge Janine before, you'll love her now. If you Uh loved her as much as I do and did before, you'll be gushing with love. You won't be able to find enough emotions in your body after this 20-second clip. Hillary, since you started the name calling, Hillary, you are a liar and a pathological one at that. You're a cheat. You're dishonest. You are condescending. You are arrogant, contemptuous. And if you think that your half-assed apology will wipe the slate clean, you are wrong. Wow. Wow. Liar. She <laughs> left no stone unturned. That is exactly how the judge feels about Hillary. Uh, oh, and yes, by the way, 17 hours later, 17 hours after Hillary made that comment, she came out and said, I'm sorry, I should have said that. Oh, she apologized. So she knows she did wrong. But here's the thing. It's back like, when it's Romney good. did it. When Romney did it, it was all about... Um, the media was going to use that to destroy him. Fast forward to today with Hillary saying something like that, they're going to do everything that they can to uh, shield her from criticism. Correct. So it's going to be the opposite. What, what it boils down to is it lets you know just how powerful the media is, and it's really disgusting. It's disgusting to me because um, I think that 
that everything that politicians do and say should stand on, on their own merit. And instead, we have um, the media that is preventing people from even hearing these things being said. And that's a problem. Right. Well, not only that, but uh, this whole thing with North Korea launching its uh, uh, testing its fifth nuclear weapon and possibly has uh, uh, ranging missiles that may hit somewhere in America, whether it be Alaska or, or the island, some, somewhere. We, we've got a major, major issue going on with Obama literally trying to obliterate America uh, before he's even out of office. If Hillary gets the, the reins, it will be the demise, the destruction. It will be the, the Julius Caesar of Rome that literally just brings the country to its knees, crumbling by giving away free things. And if you didn't know, Rome fell because it gave the citizens free stuff. Yeah, there's a free bunch welfare of, stuff. There's a bunch of oh. scary things about Parallel. the fall of the Roman Empire that is just scary. So the last thing I've got right here, Lou Dobbs, uh, Lou Dobbs uh, came out and said, you know what? This is kind of interesting. The money that, that uh, Hillary spends and the money that Trump's spending, this is interesting. Let's, uh, let's see what that's all about. Grads and younger voters. But the race, Trump winning among white voters, men, older voters, those without college degrees, even has a 20-point advantage among independents. Mrs. Clinton, meanwhile, leads among women, non-white voters, college grads, and younger voters. But the race is tightening by the day, despite her barrage of attacks against him. A new analysis shows Mrs. Clinton dominating on attack ad spending by a six-to-one one margin over Trump. Six-to-one! Clinton has now spent more than $81 million on those ads in the general election, compared to Trump's $13 million. And when you factor in spending from super PACs, Clinton and her supporters outspending Trump by a five to one margin. To what effect, though? Despite the vicious attack as the sheer power of her ad spending, there's been almost no impact on Trump at all. In fact, he's managed to pull within three points of her, two points in the three most recent polls. Yo, yeah, the, the attack ads. She spent 81 million to Trump's 13 interesting and literally he is of all intents and purposes if there was true polling he is ahead of her in all polls if you polled correctly it would be trump ahead and if you added in the independence it would be it's already starting to go that way and then you throw the independence in it's all over with folks I, i'm telling you, there's not much more left yeah, I think the, and these polls have been skewed the wrong way on purpose in order to uh, shape public opinion. And I think that uh, I'm really hoping I'm really hoping I'm still worried about what happened with Romney. Um, there was so much polling that showed that he was down by a little tiny bit, a couple points, and he ended up losing by a couple points. Well, the turnout was the turnout for Obama that second time around was much, much lower than his first election, and the turnout for Romney was lower than McCain. Well, and it kind of makes me think that maybe there was a fix in effect, the throwaway ballots. Right, either throwaway ballots uh, or or the Republicans were in on it. Well, because yeah. you don't want to, you don't want McC you don't Romney did not want to be the first white man to defeat <laughs> the first black man. Well, yeah, and you can see that with the way that he uh, acted uh, in his second and third debate. Oh. He was scared that he was going to look like uh, he was uh, being a little bit too mean to oh my a goodness. black man. I guess it looks so. like I'm going to win. So. What do I do? All right, folks. Well, the fastest three hours you'll spend anywhere right here on Smith Radio. Uh, um, Don't shit. follow us. Follow yeah, us. Yep. Yeah, follow us on Facebook at smithradio.com or smithradio on Twitter, on Facebook, facebook.com slash smithradio. It's, it's spelled S M Y T H. Right. And our, our, our YouTube account is absolutely exploding. So join us on YouTube as well. And then iHeartRadio. And I made a short shortcut for you all to go to. It's iHeart.smithradio.com. That'll take you directly to our iHeart page. Uh, joined, jo join the, uh, join, join the crew as we're talking live. You go to the message board on Spreaker.com backslash Radio Smith. 
Now I'm working on getting that changed, folks. Did you have a good week and a good weekend? We will be back here next Sunday, same bat time, same bat channel. Do I have to pay somebody to say that? Or can I say bat time, bat channel? Probably have to pay. Hey, what's up? Can you hear me? With unfathomable power. What kind of power? Unfathomable. It's unf without fathom.